Thank you. The next item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion 10072 in the name of James Kelly on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal Scotland Bill at stage one. Can I invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on James Kelly, to the member in charge of the bill, to speak to and move the motion in his name. Thank you, presiding officer, and I move the motion in my name. The Football Act has completely failed to tackle sectarianism. It is illiberal and unfairly targets football fans. It has been condemned by legal experts, human rights organisations and equality groups. The SNP government must now produce a unified approach working through Parliament, charities and education. It is time to scrap this discredited act. I acknowledge, presiding officer, that this is a serious matter this afternoon. I am proposing uh, a private member's bill that seeks to repeal in full an act of the Scottish Parliament. And in doing so, I think it's, it's, it's very reassuring that we have a robust process that requires me to run through an initial consultation, which had over 3,000 responses, over 74% of which supported my proposal, a final proposal which requires to be uh, signed by, Epi uh, uh, by MSPs across uh, the chamber and of course the parliamentary process of three stages which is commenced by the Justice Committee hearings. And can I place on record my thanks to the Justice Committee uh, clerks, officials, uh, people who gave evidence and also MSPs uh, for I feel they have produced a comprehensive body of work which will add to the parliamentary consideration of uh, my bill. I think it, uh, it is worth giving some reflection to the introduction of the original Act of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act. Um, much has been made of the background to the uh, 2011 Celtic Rangers game and the events after that. Um, I mean, it should be said that there was, um, you know, in that session of the Parliament, um, some MSPs felt that the SNP government had a somewhat ambivalent approach to sectarianism. I can remember a, an angry clash between Jack McConnell and uh, Fergus Ewing. So when there was talk about uh, an approach to tackle sectarianism, uh, it was welcomed in some quarters. However, uh, looking back at the record uh, from 2011 earlier this week, uh, and also, obviously I was closely involved in that, and I, I led the, the Labour opposition to the Act, it became clear that where the, the SNP attempts to uh, gain all parliamentary support for the legislation fell down was in their lack of consultation, willingness to work for, for, with other parties, and also the fundamental issue that the Act wasn't about tackling sectarianism, it was about uh, targeting football fans. And I think that's what led to a position where all opposition MSPs uh, opposed the Act in the final stage three vote in 2011. I think when we then went on to the implementation, uh, it was characterised by uh, aggressive policing, which caused a lot of friction uh, with fans. There was confusion over definitions in the Act and what was legal and what was not legal. Uh, police officers had to be sent on a training course uh, in order to learn up on what was potentially offensive chanting under the Act. And you know what, what he ended up was a lot of division, division between uh, police and fans, division between political parties and confusion amongst the judiciary. Uh, as to, to what was uh, legal or not legal under the Act. Uh, a lot of these, and a lot of these themes uh, ran all the way through uh, to today, six years down the line. So it's no surprise that we've arrived at the, the, the position we have. In terms of the, the Section 1 evidence that the Justice Committee heard, we heard a, a very clear view from uh, supporters that they didn't feel the, the act was fair in terms of it targeted football supporters. They didn't feel that it was effective. And 
they felt that it had led to a deterioration in relationships uh, between police and fans. Uh, from a legal point of view, we heard from the Law Society, uh, who advised the committee that all of the uh, convictions brought forward in the previous year could have been captured under pre-existing laws, for example, Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act in relation to breach of the peace, and Section 74 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003 uh, in relation to religious uh, aggravation. Um, we also heard uh, from the Law Society that they had a concern that the, the Act had far too wide a reach, uh, and as a, as a result of that, um, there was a likelihood that there would be further legal challenges, uh, and that would undermine the, the already uh, diminished credibility of the Act. I think it's also important to emphasise the evidence from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, a well-respected body who worked closely with the Scottish Government, and they draw the, drew the Justice Committee's <coughs> attention to the fact that there were still remained uh, two potential areas where the Act uh, would breach ECHR, and all of that would lead uh, to a lack of legal certainty. There were also several academics who gave evidence to the committee who questioned the uh, potential implications of the Act in relation of uh, freedom of speech. But I think allied to the evidence... Uh, yes, I'll say that. Jim I thank the member for taking the intervention. He's talking about... Uh, about uh, evidence that the committee received. The Equality Network, Stonewall Scotland and the Scottish Council for Jewish Communities all said in their evidence that repealing the Act without a viable alternative, as he is suggesting, would send out exactly the wrong message about sectarianism and our attitude to it in society. James Kelly. Uh, I'll, I'll cover the points about um, you know, messaging and alternative towards the end of my speech. Uh, in terms of the, the Section 1 evidence, I think it is important to look at some of the human examples and the impact that this has had on people's lives. Uh, one of the tranches of data from recent years showed that 49% of the convictions under the Act uh, were young people under 20. And I think one of the unfortunate things is that those that have been captured under this Act um, tend to be young working class males, they tend to have not had uh, previous offences and they tend to, to be in, um, in employment. And I can't believe that the Scottish Government intended that when they brought forward the Act in 2011. Yeah. No, I want to make some progress on this. Um, I can't believe that the Scottish Government intended uh, that as a, as a consequence. And I think if you look at some of the cases, uh, you see how unfair the act is, and also just the impact that it had on people's lives. You know, there was an instance of a, a Rangers fan with a, an Axe the Act uh, banner, obviously in relation to this, this legislation, uh, and he was arrested. Another feature uh, is that of the police using overnight curfews. Um, a Motherwell fan uh, singing a song about an opposition team was kept detained uh, for four days in Greenock Prison. Um, a HIB supporter who had no previous convictions and uh, his, own, uh, his own voluntary efforts attended a police station uh, with his lawyer and a family, was charged and then uh, detained overnight. And there's also the, eff the effect on people's lives and people's co career. There was young, one young man who was charged and after a le lengthy proceedings found not guilty, but he had to inform his employer due to disclosure rules and it, this caused a lot of stress. He felt his career was under threat. There was a lot of family pressures. Um, there also have been a number of pe people captured in, under this act of student teachers, NHS professionals, and have been caught up in prolonged legal battles that have had a, a, a real strain. So there's a, a real human impact on the way uh, people have been, been targeted and captured under this uh, act. I think in relation to section six, that's the section that deals with threatening communications. Uh, you could certainly argue in, in terms of when the act was introduced originally, it was, it, it was unusual that it, it, it was bolted on 
to the section in relation to offensive behaviour at football, but there's certainly a case that legislation uh, in relation to online abuse uh, is, is, is clearly very essential because that's something that's grown in recent years. However, um, yes, I can. Thank you. I would just like to ask the member how he intends to then address the points specifically raised by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, where they identified three specific areas that Section 6 addresses, three very important areas. So how will the repeal of this Act solve those problems? James Kelly. Yeah, I, was just, um, I was just going on to, to, to cover this. Uh, although it's uh, well-intentioned, as the police told us at the Justice Committee, the, again, because of the way the, the, the Section 6 has been drafted, the legal threshold uh, is actually too high and it's difficult to secure prosecutions. And as a result, police and prosecutors uh, are not actually using Section 6. There's only been 17 cases brought forward in the six uh, years that the Act's been in operation. And there was only one conviction in 2000. No, 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 I'm, I'm dealing, I've had an intervention and I'm dealing with this point. <laughs> Uh, in two th it was only one conviction in 2016, so clearly uh, the Act has not been effective in terms of threatening communications. And as the police clearly told us, what they're doing to secure prosecutions is they're using the uh, Communications Act 2003 rather than Section th 6 of the, the Threatening Communications <coughs> section. So that, that section, although well intended, uh, is not uh, fit for purpose, in my opinion. So what, what, we, what we therefore have as a result of all this, uh, and this uh, uh, comes me to John, brings me to John McAlpine's point, is we actually have um, a very weak message in terms of this legislation. Because don't forget, all the way through these six years, only one party, the governing party, actually continues to support the legislation. And I think that that severely undermines the credibility of the message. I think when you've got legal experts as well saying that the basis of the act is, uh, is weak and it continu its operation, continued operation will result in legal challenges and potentially challenges under ECHR, I don't think it operates well in terms of legislation. It also ca causes a lot of confusion um, out uh, in communities in terms of what is legal as not. So there's a very weak message coming through from that act and it has also failed to tackle uh, sectarianism. Looking back at the 2011 debate, I noted in my speech that I, uh, I drew attention to the 696 uh, instances of religious aggravation in the previous year. Um, there have been 719 uh, religious aggravations in the past year. So the number of religious aggravation charges has actually grown in the time that the Act has been in. Uh, it's the highest for four years and only 7% of them related to football. So the Act's completely failed in terms of tackling sectarianism. And what we need is a completely new approach. We need, we need a unified approach. We need to bring the political parties, um, the fans, the legal experts together to emphasise a strong message around pre-existing legislation uh, that works. I think we also need to invest in education and support sectarian programmes rather than cutting those programmes. And allied to that, we need work between police, uh, football clubs and football fans in order to, produce, to, to promote good behaviour at football. I think those three strands are a good way to move forward, far more effective than the discredited legislation we've got in place. And with that, um, presiding offer, Officer, I submit my motion in support of the full repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. Thank you very much. And I call on Margaret Mitchell to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee and to summarise the findings of our Stage 1 report on the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill. A majority of the committee supports the general principles of the bill, which has divided opinion. The committee report reflects both sides of the debate. Although members were divided on whether or not to support the general principles of the bill, the rest of our report contains unanimous recommendations and conclusions. 
I thank all my committee colleagues for their efforts and willingness to achieve this outcome. This is a contentious bill and therefore it presented a difficult challenge for the Justice Committee clerks to reflect all views. The entire committee would therefore like to record its thanks to the clerks for the excellent work they have done in producing this stage one report. Furthermore, whilst committee opinion was divided on the solution, all members agree that sectarianism and offensive behaviour should be challenged wherever it is found. In terms of the committee's consideration of the bill, in June, an open call for evidence was issued and 30 submissions were received from organisations and over 250 from individuals. These submissions helped to identify the key issues to explore with witnesses and oral evidence. Members took evidence from eight panels of witnesses over the course of six committee meetings. These panels comprised of academics, fans groups, legal experts, religious groups and equality groups, as well as the Minister and James Kelly. The committee thanks everyone who provided oral and or written submissions. The issues explored included whether repeal would create a gap in the law, the effectiveness of both the Section 1 and Section 6 offences within the, the 2012 Act, and what message repeal would send. The 2012 Act created two new offences. Section 1 is the offence which covers offensive behaviour at regulated football matches, and the Section 6 offence covers threatening communications. In evidence, the committee heard concerns from witnesses about both offences. It also heard warnings that the poten of the potential consequences of their repeal. Those who support retention of the 2012 Act considered that repeal would send the wrong message about what is and what is not acceptable behaviour. And those who apply the 2012 Act stated that they believed the Section 1 offence was fit for purpose and clearly understood by police officers. On the other hand, those in favour of repeal considered that the Section 1 offence discriminated against football fans and was poorly drafted, resulting in its inconsistent application by police officers. The committee also heard some evidence on how the 2012 Act could, if retained, be amended. Quoted in our report is a swathe of change, uh, changes which the legislative academic Andrew Tickell suggested could be made to improve, the section, uh, to improve Section 1. The Minister committed to considering any improvements offered to Section 1 and the minority, a minority of the committee who did support uh, the general principles is of the view that the Scottish Government should revisit the 2012 Act and bring forward constructive amendments. The Section 6 offence also split opinion, but for different reasons. Those in favour of retaining the 2012 Act argued that repeal would create a gap in the law, a topic I shall return to later. This was of particular concern for some religious groups such as the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities. However, those who support repeal of the 2012 Act argued that Section 6 is really used due to the high threshold created by its wording. The committee agreed that should the bill be passed, it would be appropriate to consider how the provisions within Section 6 could be updated and included in any further revision to hate crime legislation. Turning again, if... James you know, Dornan. Uh, Ms Mitchell tell me if the committee came to a conclusion about how they could fill the gap between repeal and the Section 6 being enacted, because it seems to me that even although you say it's not been enacted often, it still is a very important bill to have in statute book. Margaret Mitchell. You're, you're in patience and I'm coming to that point exactly. Um, right, and Section 6. Turning now, yes. Uh, whether passage of it would create the gap, those in favour of retention highlighted the offence of incitement to religious hatred provision contained in Section 6, as well as the extraterritoriality provisions within the Act and the sentencing powers within um, 
six, uh, uh, section six. Uh, those who supported repeal of the 2012 Act pointed out that breach of the peace and the Communications Act 2003 and Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010 would be applicable to types of behaviour covered by the 2012 Act. The committee concluded on balance both sides of the debate were accurate in their description of what repeal would mean and that um, that other than the offence of incitement to religious hatred contained in Section 6, repeal would not result in behaviour or action currently um, prosecuted under the 2012 Act becoming legal. And we go on to develop what we can do then, which is coming to your point, um, Mr John. As well as the policy debate surrounding the bill, there was also much debate in the committee around the timing of proposed repeal. Lord Backingdale is currently in the midst of an independent review of hate crime legislation due to report in spring 2018 under the auspices of which um, cover the 2012 Act. And some witnesses argued the committee and parliament as a whole should delay its consideration of this bill until Lord Brackendale's review had concluded. However, the committee is aware that Lord Barkendale's own consultation paper states the review will therefore consider how the law should be best, uh, we should best deal with the type of hate crime behaviour covered by Section 1 and in parallel with the Parliament's consideration of James Kelly's repeal bill. The final recommendations by the review will take into account the law as it, exists, uh, as it is anticipated at that point. Point. Given the information and given the wide scope of Lord Brackendale's review, together with the time it may take to properly examine his report once published, the committee un, uh, unanimously agreed um, in its report that it would not be appropriate to delay the parliamentary consideration of the bill while Lord Brackendale concludes his work. Furthermore, the committee as a whole was interested to hear of what measures could be taken to tackle uh, sectarianism and hate crime. This bill has in reinvig reinvigorated the discussion on what is and what is not acceptable behaviour. Members agreed regardless of whether the 2012 Act is repealed or retained, the time is right for further publicity and education on what is and what is not acceptable behaviour. And the committee also recommended that defining sectarianism in Scots law could be a useful step and stress that education is vital to tackling such attitudes. Members were very uh, interested to hear about the Sacro Tackling uh, Offending Prejudice Stop Service, which provides diversions from prosecution and works with people to help identify their uh, own attitudes and behaviours in an effort to effect long-lasting change. Unfortunately, this service and others like it have hardly been used uh, in relation to the 2012 Act and the committee therefore recommended that these schemes where appropriate should, uh, and should be used more widely. In conclusion, presiding officer, a majority of the members of the committee support the general principles of the bill at stage one and the entire committee looks forward to continuing to explore the issues raised by witnesses should the bill uh, return to committee at stage two. Thank you very much. I now call on Annabel Ewing to open for the government. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This government stands on the side of the vast majority of football fans who want to enjoy the game with friends and family in an atmosphere untainted by offensive, abusive or threatening behaviour. Sadly, we continue to see problematic behaviour at football. A persistent minority seem to think it is their right to behave as they please with no regard for those around them or wider society. We do not see similar behaviours at other sporting events or indeed in other places where large numbers of the public gather for entertainment. This season alone has witnessed the abuse of Dunfermline Athletics Dean Shields by opposition players and fans, vile online abuse towards young Celtic Foundation Ambassador Jay Beatty, banners replicating images associated with paramilitary groups, and people posting offensive comments on social media about the Ibrox disaster. I would like to make a wee bit of progress, thank you. Above all, we want to ensure that people remain protected from these crimes and recognise <laughs> that this behaviour will not just disappear. Actions and interventions are required. I'm not sure who's... Joanne Lamond. Minister, would you agree that many good football fans who want this bill repealed also abhor that kind of behaviour in the football grounds? Minister Annabel Ewing. I agree with 
Joanne Lamont, the vast majority of football fans uh, do not uh, uh, condone this behaviour, but the fact of the matter is that nonetheless, uh, many uh, now will not take their friends and families to football games because of the fact of this uh, prejudicial uh, and hateful behaviour. And I think that is a terrible shame. Uh, in terms of, I would like to make a bit of progress, uh, in terms of recognising that other interventions are of course important, it is important to stress, presiding officer, that this government has invested £13 million pounds since 2012 to support organisations to tackle sectarianism. Unprecedented unprecedented amount, far in excess of anything provided by previous administrations. Our work focused on education in schools, communities, prisons and workplaces and has delivered the first ever national education resource while supporting teacher training to roll it out. I'll take an intervention, though Mr Kelly wasn't very keen on taking my intervention, but there we go. James Kelly. Oh, thank you, Minister. I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to sum it up. Can you just confirm that in terms of the work of sense over sectarianism, their uh, budget was cut from 2.3 million in 15-16 to 800,000 in 16-17. Minister. Informed, presiding officer, uh, funding of 2.3 million has not been awarded to any individual organisation. In fact, Sense of Sectarianism have received a total of £340,000 from the Scottish Government in the last three years. The Offensive Behaviour Act is part of our work to tackle hate crime. The Act was not about replacing existing law, but about giving better and sharper tools to police and prosecutors. Section 1 covers hateful behaviour, which stirs up hatred against others based on their religious affiliation, race, colour, nationality, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, transgender identity or disability. Why would we want to hear vile language used against any of these communities in our football grounds? In their most recent briefing notes, Stonewall Scotland confirmed that 60% of sports fans have witnessed anti-LGBT language or behaviour in a sports setting and 82% said it took place in relation to football. Section 1 also prevents people from expressing support for terrorism and glorifying or mocking incidents involving the loss of life or serious injury. What justification is there for allowing this kind of behaviour at football? Of course, freedom of speech has to be protected, but that has to be surely balanced against the damage that offensive speech causes. The Justice Committee heard from those representing minority communities who emphasised the very damaging impact that hateful language and behaviour has in undermining and destabilising our diverse <laughs> communities. I'm sorry, I must make some progress. The Act provides extraterritorial powers, ensuring that freedom of movement does not mean escaping the law. Section 6 brings Scotland into line with the rest of the UK in relation to incitement to religious hatred, ensuring that religious communities in Scotland have as much protection as they do in the rest of the UK. These powers will be lost, presiding officer, if this Act is repealed. We have heard that the Act breaches human rights. The bill was certified as being within the legislative competence of the Parliament, which includes compliance with Convention when it was introduced, and there have been a legal challenge uh, in the courts on the grounds that it breaches human rights in all the time that it has been in force. So I blame the Act for a breakdown in relations between them and the police. Yet the Act has a provision for Scotland evidence to commit there had been no deterioration at the relationship from police perspective. If the Act is repealed, the evidence to the Justice Committee suggests that there will be no change to operational thank also the Justice Committee for producing uh, what is a very thorough uh, piece of work and I am considering action uh, in response but can confirm that my officials have already instructed, been instructed to look at the scope for creating a legal definition of sectarianism and will report on this in due course. The Justice Committee report notes that those against repeal think that the Act should be amended and we have been consistently clear in our commitment to work with those who have concerns and parties still wish pursued the amendment route, uh, the door remains open. The Scottish Government is of course also conscious of the will of Parliament and if that will is to support the principles of the repeal bill then it is entirely responsible for us, indeed it is our duty to make sure the implications of the are fully and taken to mitigate the impact of any law as a result uh, repeal. Equality groups have been very clear that they place great importance in the protection that the Act offers them. And it is absolutely right that we look at constructive ways to ensure that support for repeal does not leave them feeling exposed 
and unprotected. If the bill is passed at stage one, then the Scottish Government would uh, seek to ensure that there is a continuity of protection for minority communities. We would certainly hope that even the most strident supporter of repeal would wish to work constructively with us to build a consensus to put in place protections for all vulnerable communities ahead of repeal, including considering a delay in the implementation of the bill, if necessary, to allow us the time to do so. In particular, the loss of Section 6 powers would be worrying for those communities as they are concerned about the possibility of their children, families and friends being exposed to online abuse, and it is right that this is addressed through legislation. Presiding officer, simply going back to where we were before the Act was introduced is retrograde and counterproductive and will do nothing to tackle abusive behaviour at football or protect vulnerable communities. Repealing this Act with no viable alternative will do nothing to help us build the country we aspire to be. Regrettably, there will be negative consequences of repealing the Act for our vulnerable communities. And I ask Parliament to reflect very carefully on what they are doing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Liam Kerr to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I open for the Scottish Conservatives to speak in favour of the principles of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Repeal Scotland Bill. The 2012 Act is bad law. On its progress through Parliament, the initial bill was met with criticism and disapproval from all opposition parties who believed the legislation was unfair, unacceptable, and inconsistent. And almost five years later, it is clear that consensus remains. So much so that in November 2016, a clear majority of MSPs voted to repeal the 2012 Act as a matter of priority. Now, during the stage three proceedings of the 2012 Act, Rosanna Cunningham, then the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, said the critical role for government is to ensure that law is fit for purpose. This legislation is not fit for purpose. A senior judge said it was horribly drafted. Andrew Tickell told the committee the Act specifically instructs judges to completely ignore the actual context in which the behaviour takes place. That is perverse. Professor Sir Tom Devine has said the 2012 Act would go down in history as the most illiberal and counterproductive Act passed by our young Parliament to date. And the Scottish Human Rights Commission said restrictions of freedom of expression made the Act contrary to human rights treaties. And in 2014, reported their concerns to the UN so that they could monitor whether the restrictions placed on freedom of speech are truly necessary in a democratic society. Yes, I will. John Mason. Wei, is he arguing that there should be total freedom of speech and there should be no limits on any hatred or anything, either at football or elsewhere? Liam Kerr. Uh, I think uh, what I'm arguing, uh, on, on that specific point, I'd actually refer John Mason to the evidence of the committee when we heard some quite interesting information on that. Uh, what I would say is no, we're dealing with a very specific act and as we'll see in a second, I think it should be taken away for the reasons that I'll come on to. So I can very easily get to a starting point that this law should not remain on the statute book. But I listened very carefully in committee and I reflected on a number of the concerns that were raised. I heard much concern around the message that would be sent if this act was repealed. And note the important quotes in the committee's report. But I asked myself, will that message be sent? Well, ACC Higgins stated clearly, repealing the act might be interpreted by some as a lifting of the restrictions or it might not. Dr. Joseph Webster said, repeal does not mean affirming the validity of the currently prescribed behavior. He felt that the way in which repeal is perceived is all of our collective responsibility to deal with. And he's right. It is all of our duty to send a message that hate crime is illegal and still will be after repeal. And I thought James Kelly made an important and persuasive point that the current message is weak in any event. To say that legislation should not be repeal, repealed because it might send a problematic message to potential offenders is not a good enough reason not to repeal it. And what about the positive message that Paul Quigley of Fans Against Criminalization suggested would be sent? That football fans will no longer unfairly and unduly be criminalized as they have been under the 2012 Act in the specific way that people in wider society are not. The second concern I reflected upon was that there might be a legislative lacuna. Seven months ago, Annabel Ewing told this chamber, repealing this act in the absence of a viable alternative demonstrates contempt for those targeted. Correct. 
But the committee heard from the Law Society of Scotland that all 287 charges brought under Section 1 of the Act in 2015-16 could have been prosecuted under pre-existing legislation. Very briefly. Minister. Grateful to the member. I just would also perhaps point the member to the evidence given by the Crown and uh, Office and Procreation, Procreation of Fiscal Service, who uh, detailed exactly uh, in their evidence where the issues of concern would arise. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm grateful for the intervention, uh, and I would in turn point back to the evidence of ACC Higgins, who said in the absence of the Act, someone who was arrested for singing an offensive song would almost certainly have been charged with a breach of the peace or a Section 38 offence. Professor Fiona Leverick agreed, stating the common law crime of breach of the peace, Section 38 and a number of statutory aggravations are in place and continuing to be, and that offensive behaviour at football matches could be dealt with under pre-2012 legislation. My final concern was around this. Has it worked? Well, Dr John Kelly told the committee that since the 2012 Act came in, there have actually been more of what the Scottish Government might define as problematic songs. Dr Joseph Webster said, what fans have done is change their behaviour by holding their hands in front of their mouths while singing certain songs in order to prevent CCTV from capturing them singing them. They have replaced certain songs and chants with other words to try and skirt the law. And Annabel Ewing said clearly earlier on, sadly we continue to see such behaviour at football. It's clear she agrees that this isn't working. And even if you feel that such chanting has diminished. Professor Fiona Leverick told the Justice Committee it is impossible to tell whether that is because of the Act because there are so many other factors. Correlation is not causation. The Act has not brought about behavioural change of itself. It has not changed the underlying drivers of prejudice or discouraged the expression of offensive behaviour. It has redirected those behaviours, those prejudices, camouflaged them, but it has not stopped them. The 2015 Morrow Report states there is no single simple answer to deep-seated issues of social division such as sectarianism and that the key to achieving real change is a balanced mix of community-led civil and government action. We need an enduring change in culture and attitude, but that happens in homes, classrooms, communities. It is facilitated by the work of charities and third sector, sector organisations such as Nil by Mouth and we need to see and support more of that community-led activity. Deputy Presiding Officer, I've heard the objections and I've reflected on them. I've dealt with those objections and the only plausible conclusion is that the 2012 Act must be repealed. Therefore, the general principles of this bill are sound and I shall vote accordingly today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. I call Daniel Johnson to open for Labour. Seven minutes, please, Mr uh, Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This Parliament has a mixed reputation when it comes to legislation. There are some who believe that that may be through structural problems, something to do with our Constitution as a unicameral Parliament, perhaps, that has led to poor quality legislation, drafting errors, or ill thought through laws being passed by this place. So I welcome the reforms that the presiding officer has brought forward to improve our processes. Perhaps more post-legislative scrutiny will help improve the quality of legislation coming from this Parliament. Now that may be an unpopular opinion to voice in this chamber, but it's one held by many people outside this Parliament. So I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on a very particular form of post-legislative scrutiny, because I think that on this 2012 Act, those critics have a point. It is a bad law, a bad law because it does not add to the existing law, something that has been pointed out by the Law Society. It's a bad law because it has sown division between those who feel targeted by the law and the police. And it is a bad law because it's too open to interpretation by individual police officers. So I very much welcome this opportunity to look again at the 2012 Act and take forward my colleague James Kelly's proposals to scrap the Act. The arguments have been made very well by Mr Kelly and I want to commend him for his stewardship of his member's bill to this stage. As someone who has just recently opened uh, a consultation on a bill, I know how much work that it has taken for both him and his staff to get to this stage. I would very much like to add my support to those arguments that, that Mr Kelly has made in speech and add the full support of the Labour benches to them. I want to take my speech, however, just take a slightly different direction and refute some of the arguments that have been made against scrapping this act. First, there is an argument that we should wait until Lord Brackadale's review. Indeed, Margaret Mitchell 
made a, a, a good comment around this. To, uh, the Board Brackdale's review into the hate crime legislation wait until it's complete. However, Board Brackdale's review is explicit in, in it being run in parallel with this bill's passage through Parliament. Indeed, Lord Brackadale himself has explicitly stated in his consultation paper that the recommendations will take into account the law as it exists or it is anticipated at that point. Now, we await Lord Brackadale's recommendations with interest and look forward to seeing how this Parliament can look to improve our hate crime legislation. However, using Lord Brackadale's review to hold up scrapping of this act would be spurious at best. Indeed, the Justice Committee's report states that it would, be not, it would not be appropriate to delay consideration of this bill on those grounds. Second, there is an argument that there will be a gap in the law created by scrapping the Act. But that simply is not the case. Academics, including Professor Leverick, have argued that common law breach of the peace, Section 38, and a number of statutory aggravations can be, uh, can be and should be used if the Act were to be scrapped. Indeed, the laws... Indeed, the Law Society, as I alluded to, argued that the 2012 Act did not improve upon the existing uh, common law and existing statutory law, and they said they are not of the view that its repeal will leave a gap in the criminal law. And if uh, uh, Ms Ewing would like to say why they are wrong, I'd, I'd be grateful to hear Minister, it. Minister. Thank you. I would uh, point the member to the evidence of the Crown and, uh, Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, which he can read uh, in the Justice Committee evidence sessions. Um, but also, of course, uh, the, the uh, repeal will remove also Section 6, which is therefore removing the specific offence of incitement of, to religious hatred from Scots law. Does the member feel that that sends a good signal to society. Daniel Johnson. Again, all the minister can point to is the signal. The point is that that section is ineffective and that's been pointed out on a number of occasions. The fact that it can really only be used in a handful of cases and the fact that so many people have pointed to the threshold being too high should, I think, uh, 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 allow the, the minister to realise that it is simply ineffective. And indeed, back to the previous one, the Law Society's evidence states very clearly that all 377 charges under the Act in 2016 could have been captured by pre-existing legislation. So therefore, it's not, just, it's not just academics and lawyers saying this. The police themselves have said that. Indeed, in their evidence, they said that a repeal will not pose a significant operational change. They said that they would address the behavior using other legislation. The assistant chief constable went on to say that regarding boots on the ground and how football matches are policed, little, if anything, would change. So let's not delay this decision where no gap is created in the law and there is no impact on Lord Brackadale's review. But the third argument is that th those arguments saying about, uh, that they will, regarding the message that it would send out. Legislation, as we know, is not just about what is passed, but what the message to society is. Laws are both led by and, led and lead societal change. The 2012 Act had a clear message. It was very clearly designed to show that the action would be taken on sectarianism. So what message does repealing the 2012 Act sends. But I would argue it sends this message. It shows that this is a responsible parliament fixing the problems created by poor legislation and scrapping a law that overly focuses on a particular group in society when the problems are much, part of a much wider societal issues. I, I don't really feel I have time, Mr. Dorman. Ms. Dorman, I apologise. This will only send a, a message about the acceptance of sectarian if we let it. Throughout the passage of Mr Kelly's bill, Labour have continued to argue that sectarianism is a blight on our country that shames us all. It is unacceptable and it should not happen. We must tackle the, uh, the issue, issue but through education, particularly with young people. We should work with football clubs and fans to change their views. We won't allow anyone, therefore, to portray the scrapping of this act as sending out a message that sectarianism is acceptable or that we are, are not keen to tackle it. But most importantly... My party and this parliament, I believe, are united in our belief that action must be taken, but that does not justify an unworkable, illiberal, poorly drafted law remaining on the books. In conclusion, presiding officer, the arguments put forward by the opponents to this bill simply do not hold up. There is no need to wait for Lord Brackdale's re review. There is no gap created in the legislation. There is no suggestion that by repealing this law that, that we will send any other message other than this, that this is a bad law and we should scrap it. It's drafting, it's controversy, it's failure to do more than the existing laws have helped to discredit it. This parliament has already voted in a motion in 2016 which called on the government to scrap the act. The Justice Committee has now delivered a report that agrees with that. 
Mr Kelly's proposal is simple. Scrap the Act. And I urge all members to vote for Stage 1 of this bill. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I now move to the open debate. Speeches of five minutes, though there is a little time in hand for interventions which you can make up. I call George Adam to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, presiding officer. You know, listening to the debate so far, there's been much made of the 3,000 fans who actually engaged with the process. But if you look at the recent figures for just the Scottish Premiership, the average weekly attendance is 193,220. So even looking at the Premiership, that's one and a half percent of football fans who have engaged with this, uh, this whole uh, scenario. So I think we have to balance this and look at it from that perspective as well. And at this point, presiding officer, can I also put on the record that I'm the convener of the St Merlin Independent Supporters Association, who have a 28% share in St Merlin FC. And my explanation for that is as well is because I'm a great believer in fan empowerment. The whole idea of that programme is that after a 10 year period, the fans and the community in Paisley will own their professional football club. And for me, that's one of the most important parts in football, that it is the fans that are involved in football at all levels. But in football itself, presiding officer, it was the great Pele, in my opinion, the greatest player the world has ever seen, that coined the phrase, the beautiful game. And at its core, there is no better explanation or description for football. The world, all the world over, football fans will support, argue, discuss every aspect of the game. And as the game, <coughs> when it's played at its best, there is no other sport that can compete. But that passion, that spirit for the game can at times descend into a nasty place. I have come to this debate and dealt with it first and foremost as a football fan. Football's in my DNA, or more accurately, presiding officer St Murn Football Club is. The team uh, in Paisley is actually termed as one town, one team. And that's how many non-football supporting buddies look at it. And it's how other supporters in the towns of other teams look at it as well. So as a football fan, that I have seen how a minority of fans can ruin the beautiful game for others and become abusive and threatening. During the Justice Committee evidence sessions, I brought up continually why this act came into place, what had happened within and out with our national game. There was an air of menace connected with some games which spilled out into normal day-to-day -day life. And I've explained that repealing this act sends an entirely wrong message to those that seek to be offensive at football. All the old song sheets will be dusted off in anticipation for the repeal. In 21st century Scotland, is that really the place we want to be? I'll take Mr Kerr. <coughs> Liam Kerr. Uh, thanks uh, for taking the intervention. Does George Adam not agree, though, that the old song sheets have merely been updated and uh, are cover that people cover their mouths with their hands to sing the same songs? George Adams. It is wrong, and even Mr yeah. Kelly, during his evidence, said it is wrong for a football fan not to sing a song that's not about football. Anything that's not connected to the game shouldn't be at a football match. And the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communication uh, criminalise hateful, threatening and offensive behaviour that is likely to initiate public disorder in relation to football. I don't see why that is a problem. And as a fan... I give you a very personal example. At St Mern Celtic game in 2010, I witnessed an example of offensive behaviour, which I found disgusting. Many will be aware that my wife Stacey is a fanatical St Mern fan and has multiple sclerosis. And as such, as a wheelchair user, some fans ha uh, had tickets for, some away fans had tickets for the St Mern end. And at the end of the game, things turned nasty. Stacey had what she believed was a reasoned discussion with an away fan only to hear a Celtic fan shout, will someone shut that, and I'll clean it up at this stage, uh, uh, presiding officer, cripple up. The situation descended into chaos. There were fans found on both sides, that totally unacceptable. Do we believe it is right for football fans, fans to express themselves in this manner? The act still allows fans to express themselves, but not in an offensive manner. But there are the support, those that report this appeal, the repeal, that believe a football fan can sing and do what they like at a game. One of the academics who strongly supports Mr Kelly's bid for repeal, Stuart Waiton, provided evidence to the committee, which in itself was shocking. In his verbal evidence, he continued to state that fans can say what they like uh, as often as they like and they have the right to do so at football. 
In a book which he wrote uh, called Football Hooliganism, Fans, Behaviour and Crime, he, he contributed to, perhaps more, most problematic, we now have a law in Scotland that could be used to target anything about re a reasonable person would find offensive at a football match. And yet football, in many respects, is all about being offensive. For me, there is a big difference between the passion for the game and the competitive, uh, competitiveness involved in supporting your team uh, than actually being offensive to someone at football. The Scottish Council of Jewish, uh, Jewish Communities agreed with me. In their written evidence, they said they were concerned the repeal of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act would send exactly the wrong message. They, add, uh, they added, <coughs> we urge the extension rather than the repeal of the legislation. But I'm not blind to the fact that the Act needs to be reviewed. That is why at stage one, the report myself and colleagues asked the Scottish Government to take another look at this Act. Thank you. I'm afraid you must conclude. I uh, gave well, you a little extra concluding, time. Thank uh, you. Presiding officer, that I've, is, I'm that means saying, conclude. I call Maurice Corey to be followed by Marie Goujon. Maurice Corey, the, please. The bill there. Let's keep the Act. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, sectarian behaviour and hate crime have no place at football games or in general Scottish society. Sectarianism has for far too long been a blight on Scottish life and has been allowed to fester and create deep wounds within our communities. The, day, the way we shall fight and end sectarianism in Scotland is by changing our culture and changing attitudes towards it. That will take place in homes, classrooms and communities the length and breadth of our country. In each situation, the action required will be different as sectarianism has taken on different guises in each community in Scotland which it affects. No single solution will fix every problem and that work is already underway. It has been, given, it has been undertaken by a huge swathe of charities and third sector organisations. What we need is to see more support for that kind of work not unnecessary legislation which adds nothing to the fight against sectarianism. And that is what Offensive Behaviour Football Act is, unnecessary. It is a politician's way of looking as though they are trying to tackle the issue without really tackling the causes head on. So it has and will not, sorry, it has not and will not help to tackle sectarianism in Scotland. The Law Society of Scotland concluded that new, the new offence didn't improve upon existing offences and that all 287 charges brought under Section 1 of Legislation 2015-16, um, and I quote, could have been prosecuted under pre-existing legislation, as my colleague Liam Kerr has already stated. They concluded that the Act has not been fundamental to tackling sectarianism, and I agree with that interpretation. The pre-existing offences, such as breach of the peace and threatening abusive behaviour, already covered the types of offences that this Act was designed to tackle. The real tragedy about the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act is that it was a wasted opportunity. It came at a time when the issues which often surround football in Scotland were flaring up badly both on the terraces and on the pitch. It has become accepted that something needed to be done, but the answer was not and never will be to railroad knee-jerk legislation through Parliament and try to wrest our way out of sectarianism. This was pointed out by the Assistant Chief Constable Higgins when he spoke to the Justice Committee and said, and I quote, I cannot arrest my way out of changing hate crime and sectarianism in this country. A far wider approach is needed to challenge behavior that is inappropriate. What should have happened was engagement with a vast majority of civilized, law-abiding football fans in this country rather than illiberal legislation that has left them being pers feeling persecuted and being blamed for the actions of a minority. They feel persecuted because they are being singled out as the only problem area in Scotland. Andrew Jenkins of Supporters Direct Scotland said, and I quote, you cannot have legislation that applies to one specific society, sector, sector of society that is grossly unfair. The consultation on the legislation sowed these feelings. A huge number of stakeholders took part in more than, and more than 3,200 football clubs and members, as we've already heard, of the public 
and the results show that 71% of respondents backed the repeal of sections 1 to 5 and 62% supported the repeal of sections 6 to 9. That's not because they're not committed to fighting sectarianism, but because they see this bill as doing nothing to help fight it. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is for those reasons which I have aforementioned I should be voting for the repeal of the offences behaviour at football and threatening communications bracket Scotland bill. Thank you. A bit of a mouthful that for you, Mr. Corrie, at the end. <laughs> a bit of a mouthful, the name of the bill. I call Morris, um, um, Mary Goujon to be followed by Mary Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm always grateful for my time on the Justice Committee because of the sheer level and scale of the, the different items that we look at. Uh, and to be honest, this, uh, the Offensive Behaviour Football Act and the repeal of that act has been no different in that sense because I wouldn't say that I, I regularly attend football <laughs> games. I'm a, a Brecon City supporter who unfortunately took on Celtic at the weekend and didn't come out of that game too favourably. Um, but I would say that if there is one positive of the, the process of going through the scrutiny of the repeal bill, is the fact that it's given the Justice Committee and this Parliament a chance to scrutinise the original Act, its operation and the impact it's had since its introduction in 2012. And I do genuinely welcome the opportunity to have done that. Um, though I would say that I do disagree with the Justice Committee's final conclusions uh, and that I don't support the, the, the general principles of the repeal bill um, because, and it is because of the message that I believe that that sends out. At the same time, that's not to say that I think that the 2012 Act is perfect, but I do think that the best way to deal with that is to amend it and not to repeal it. Now, we received a great deal of evidence, both written and oral, during the course of the committee's scrutiny, and I want to thank all of those who submitted evidence to, co to the committee, with uh, many contrasting and contradictory opinions apparent right from the outset. Uh, we heard evidence from the Glasgow Bar Association who felt that in terms of uh, Section 6, they said the power in Section 6, threatening communication, is not being used because of the narrow scope of the section and its wording, which they say makes the police not feel comfortable using it. And to that extent, I mean, I would agree with some of the points that, that James Kelly made early on uh, when he said that, you know, the intention is there, uh, but it's just that it's, it's, been, it's proven hard to implement. That may be the case, but I think the best way to deal with that, if he does agree that it's well intended uh, and that there, there is work to be done there, the way to deal with that is to amend it so that it does work, not to remove it with nothing in its place in case I missed any alternatives in his speech as I was listening. Because one thing I really want to go through here is the evidence that we heard from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in the three areas that they, where they talked about Section 6. He said that first, one of the pieces of logic behind Section 6 was that it would address a debate in connection with the Communications Act of 2003. And that related, uh, that was whether or not uh, that you could be prosecuted for sent communications or whether that included uh, either threatening behaviour on forums and blogs. The principal benefits of Section 6 are in relation to its extraterritorial provisions. And another, uh, and the third point, Section 6 also provides for greater sentencing powers than those in the 2003 Act. And he says, we've had a case in which an accused person posted comments that were supportive of a prescribed terrorist organisation, ISIS, and the view of the sentencer was that the severity of those actions should be reflected in a starting point of 24 months imprisonment. That starting point for the sentencer would not have been available in the alternative charge under the 2003 Act. Um, so, as you can see, I, again, we didn't hear any alternatives coming from James Kelly, and I'm seriously concerned that the peeling of that section of the Act with nothing in its place, the impact that that, that can have in Scotland. Now, another area I would like to cover is... Uh, when we heard from third sector organisations and charities and about the message that appealing of the act would send out. We heard from Stonewall who told us that, uh, that for LGBT people, football is a sport in which they do not feel safe or secure, whether that's because of chanting or comments that are made in the stands. He also told us that repealing the Act without putting other measures in place could undermine the work that has been undertaken by organisations such as Stonewall Scotland, the Equality Network, football clubs, Police Scotland and the criminal justice agencies to increase LGBT people's confidence, not only in reporting hate crime, but attending sporting events such as football. And in specifically relating to Section 6, 
He said, we would oppose a repeal of Section 6, which provides important protection for LGBT people who are currently experiencing an increase in abusive and threatening communications online. We strongly believe that Condition B of Section 6 of the 2012 Act should be extended to include disability, sexual orientation, transgender identity and race. Of these characteristics, only race is currently covered by other legislation. And Stonewall were by no means alone. It's important that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and leave not only a gap in the legislation, but also fail the wide number of groups who feel protected by the Act. And just to summarise, I would use the words of Andrew Tickell of Glasgow Caledonian University, who said the legal criticisms of great parts of the 2012 Act are very well founded. Parliament should respond to those failures in the bill by amending it and fixing the problems rather than repealing it. As I said at the start, I don't think you'll find one person in here who'll tell you after considering all the evidence that the 2012 Act is a perfect piece of legislation, but the way to deal with that is to amend it, not to repeal it. Thank you very much. I call Mary Fee to be followed by Rona Mackay. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to speak in favour of James Kelly's bill to repeal the flawed and illiberal offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act 2012, a piece of legislation which was forced through by the SNP government, the first act of this Scottish Parliament to gather absolutely no support from opposition parties. And it is clear that a wholly joined up approach which includes schools, colleges, football clubs, leisure clubs and law enforcement, starting in early years education, is the key to being proactive in tackling sectarianism. And let me be clear at the outset, I take a zero tolerance approach to all forms of sectarian or offensive behaviour. I have been a victim of sectarian abuse on more than one occasion, and none of these were within the context of a football match. And the most vitriolic of those episodes ended up in court because of the laws already in place prior to the 2012 Act. My son and I were subjected to vile and sectarian language and racial abuse outside of my own home. The individual concerned was charged with both racially aggravated breach of the peace an aggravated sectarian breach of the peace. On both charges, the individual was found guilty and given a substantial fine. These same laws will be used to tackle offensive and sectarian behaviour occurring at football, as they would have been without the 2012 Act. And this has been confirmed by Police Scotland during the Justice Committee's evidence sessions when Assistant Chief Constable Higgins said that someone singing an offensive song would be charged with breach of the peace or a Section 38 offence. The Law Society of Scotland and Professor Fiona Leverick said, we are of the view that the common law crime of breach of the peace, Section 38 and a number of statutory aggravations are in place and continue to be and that offensive behaviour at football matches could be dealt with under pre-2012 legislation. Therefore, it's clear that there will be no gap in the law, as is being claimed by the Scottish Government and by SNP MSPs. And, presiding officer, the targeting of football fans is unjust and illiberal. The 2012 Act has damaged relations between fans and police, and this was a predominant theme <laughs> which emerged from our evidence sessions with both fans groups and from our written evidence. And Paul Goodwin highlighted the horrific public relations of the Act. And as we can all recall, the 2012 Act was rushed and the Scottish Government, using its majority, forced this bill through Parliament. And as Stuart Regan of the SFA pointed out, there is no similar summit called for each year after tea in the park despite the high level of disorder, offensive and criminal behaviour of festival goers. No other sport or cultural event has gained the watchful eye of the Scottish Government in this manner. Professor Leverick also informs the committee that nowhere else has specifically football-related criminal offences. Yes, happy to. 
I thank the member Marie for Goujon. Uh, thank you. I thank the member for taking that intervention. And it's just really to address that point about uh, legislation specifically targeting football, because how would the, the member respond to the fact that there are 87 pieces of legislation across the UK that, that both primary and secondary that, that relate to football? Mary Fee. There is no specific piece of legislation similar to this Act anywhere else in any legislator. And that was made clear to us throughout our evidence sessions. And repealing the Act will allow the police to monitor football matches in the same manner as any other sporting event using the exact same laws. And, presiding officer, I have great sympathy with Stonewall Scotland and other equality and religious groups who express concern that repeal could send the wrong message. And to tackle that, we must be more supportive of programmes and campaigns that encourage diversity and respect in football and at all cultural events. And as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I would like to see a more inclusive approach taken by clubs, by supporters groups and by fans towards generating a more welcoming and a more family oriented atmosphere in our sporting grounds. Tackling offensive and sectarian behaviour must continue through education. Education is a proactive measure, not a reactive measure, as the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I call Rona Mackay, can I remind members if they intervene, their request to speak light goes off. So to check that you've still got a red light in front of you, Mr Dornan. I think it's you at the moment, but it happens to everyone. Uh, I call Rona Mackay to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today is the culmination of many hours of evidence taking, report reading and outreach visits to prepare for stage one of the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Scotland Repeal Bill. I too would like to thank the clerks for all their hard work and organisation. As always, it was first class. I'd also like to thank the many witnesses that took the time to give evidence in front of the Justice Committee. Clearly, this is a very contentious issue which has roused passionate opposition among football, some football fans, and I respect that. Having been born in Glasgow and growing up in the west of Scotland, I was always aware of the poisonous sectarian divides which have historically been the scourge of Scotland. In 2005, then Labour First Minister Jack McConnell said, for far too long, bigoted sectarian behaviour has been a scar on Scottish life. Bigoted sectarian attitudes have no place in a 21st century Scotland. Now, I know he wasn't just saying sectarian attitudes were on display at football matches. But no one, not even our many passionate witnesses, could deny that sectarian behaviour did and does take place at football matches. I was at an old firm match last year as part of a Justice Committee evidence-taking visit and heard it for myself. This leads into the discussion... Do yes. Liam Kerr. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Well, George Adam was clear on that point that the Act has failed, and the Black and Ethnic Minority Infrastructure in Scotland group have also said the Act fails to tackle hate crime. Does the member support both of those views? Rona Mackay. I think the Act acknowledges that we have a huge problem, and to, to repeal it would be sending out entirely the wrong message. Uh, this, this leads into the discussion, how do we define sectarianism, which is one of the recommendations made by the committee in the Stage 1 report, and something the government will consider should the bill progress to Stage 2. Presiding officer, like my colleagues, I certainly don't believe this legislation is perfect by any means. However, I don't believe outright repeal with nothing to replace it is the answer for several reasons, which I'll go on to outline. I believe the bill could be amended to address the issues in section one, which most repeal supporters object to. Of course, it would be for government to instruct amendments, but perhaps the act could be extended to cover religious marches or gatherings where sectarian behavior sometimes occurs, or sectarian behaviour happening at other events, as described by Mary Fee. With I just wanted to make a bit of progress, thanks. With careful consideration of the objections received, I'm confident that a compromise could be achieved to avoid total repeal. I listened to James Kelly on television last night saying he'd work with the government and others on alternative proposals, and I would hope that he could do that on amendments to this existing bill. Presiding officer, my main reason for not supporting the total repeal of this Act is that as others have said, I believe it will send out the wrong message to society. We've taken bold steps to show that Scotland is not living in the past, and to repeal the Act in its entirety would, in my opinion, be a retrograde step. Furthermore, and crucially, 
The committee heard heartfelt evidence from Stonewall Scotland, Victim Support Scotland, the Equality Network, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities and other churches and the Scottish Women's Convention that they did not support repeal because the Act comforted them and gave them a feeling of safety. I really don't think you can ignore evidence from respected bodies like that. Presiding officer, we all know that the majority of football fans go to a match to watch the game and cheer on their team, and so this act doesn't really concern them. I've asked friends who I know attend football regularly, and all bar one were indifferent to whether the act was there or not. So it's a vocal minority who oppose this act, and that's their right to do so. Presiding officer, we've heard a lot about section six of the bill, and it's so important, and I believe there would be a gap in the law if that was thrown out with this bill. And my colleague, Mary Gouchon, uh, articulately outlined uh, examples of that. Of course, there were divided opinions about that during evidence taking, but again, the perception of throwing out a bill which condemns threatening communications, those very words, would send out a problematic message from this parliament. In the committee's questionnaire to secondary schools, almost 66% of pupils said they had experienced online offensive behavior. And this is a critical problem today. As has been said by the Minister and others, if this repeal bill goes through today, I hope there will be enough time to plug the holes in legislation which would occur following immediate repeal. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I urge the Chamber not to kill this bill, but to amend it to send out the strong message that Scotland has moved on and intolerant attitudes have been consigned to history. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I refer to my register of interest and in, in my various associations with Heart of Midlothian Football Club. Um, the purpose of uh, the, the committee's deliberations uh, was to scrutinise uh, Mr Kelly's bill. By default, we ended up effectively doing post-legislative scrutiny on the offensive paper and threatening communications. And it was good scrutiny, and I'd like to thank everyone who participated in that, and I'd like to thank our clerks, and I'd like to thank people for the briefings. And it's certainly view that, my view that that scrutiny found the previous legislation wanting and very clearly that Mr Kelly had made his case. And, and in part that's been acknowledged by all the speakers thus far who've, who no one has yet to stand up and say, yeah, no, it's fine as it is. So I certainly support uh, Mr Kelly's uh, keenness to see the Act repealed at the earliest opportunity. And I know the Scottish Green Party who have consistently uh, opposed it uh, share that view too and we will be voting accordingly at decision time tonight. In the short time there is, I would like to, to comment on uh, one or two aspects. And that is this perception often put about by people unconnected with football, that football fans are at war with the police. That's not the case. Indeed, it's not what we heard from the police. We heard, and I quote uh, from our report, the committee also recognised that the number of football fans engaging in, in criminal behaviour is minimal and welcomes the top context provided by the SFA, Police Scotland and Fans Group, to, to demonstrate this. So it's very important to, to put things into proportion. It's also very important to, to note that the most significant aspect of policing that's affected football is self-policing, and the Tartan Army is often talked about in relation to that. Now, um, I think there was a, a very interesting debate about the right to offend, and I certainly hold views that others would find offensive, and there are a lot of people that hold mainstream views that I find deeply offensive. So. Um, I, I think that's a, a debate for another time. We are de dealing with a specific piece of legislation and um, the, the, the peculiarity of, of the Section 6 offence, people have talked about it being bolted on to, to a, a specific piece of football legislation where that particular aspect has a, a, a wider application. And I want to quote uh, from uh, very valued witnesses that I often find myself quoting from in relation to legislation and thank them for their briefings and their evidence. And the first is the Law Society. And in their evidence about the gap in the law, they make it very clear that in relation to both Section 1 and they quote a very specific stated case, Mark Harris versus Her Majesty's Advocate dated 2009, um, where they go into the, the detail of uh, uh, Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010, which has been alluded to other by me other members. And they say these examples demonstrate the ability of the criminal law to address the types of behaviour that the 2012 Act has sought to address. And we do not believe that the Section 1 offence has improved the common law breach of the peace or Section 38, and are not of the view that this repeal would fill a gap. Of course, the more significant one is in relation to, to Section 6, uh, making threatening communications. And we did receive a lot of uh, information on that. Now, I, I'm going to not quote uh, verbatim from the Law Society's um, evidence, but I, ta I tally it up as six six pieces of legislation they say, starting with the common law breach of the peace 
Section 38, they talk about the Public Order Act, they talk about the Criminal Justice Scotland Act, the Crime and Disorder Act, and Section 127 of the Communications Act 2003. So again, they say, and I do quote, we do not believe that Section 6 offences improved upon the common law and laws based in statute to address this type of behaviour and are not of the view that this that its repeal will leave a gap in the criminal law. <laughs> yes, yes. Mary Goujon. I thank the member for taking that intervention. I was just wondering how he would address then the very specific points that I raised earlier and that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service brought up in their speech about where the Section 6 actually tie, tidied up grey areas of the law in the Communications 2003 Act and what will we do then if that is repealed and yeah, where do we go from here? John Finney. Well, I would commend Professor Leverick's evidence about some alterations that could be made, and um, you'll be familiar with that. In the very short time I've left, I want to talk, touch on the issue of Stonewall. And Stonewall's an organisation that, again, I play at Grace st Store in their views, and I think what, what their members have faced at football is unacceptable. But what we know is, of course, that the fact accepted that that's notwithstanding this legislation being in place. So I would commend the approach, I think, the consensus on the committee was around that sectarianism and abuse of this nature will be addressed by education. That's what I would commend. I'd also approach the Rainbow Laces initiative. I want to, to in the, the very short time, say probably the most compelling piece of evidence that, for me, and that was the Scottish Human Rights Commission. When you have an esteemed organisation like that saying the Commission considers a strong likelihood that key provisions of the Act fall short of the principle of legal certainty and the requirement of lawfulness, that for me is, is damning to the previous legislation. And very finally, I would like to say, yes, we'll have to look, look ahead. And looking ahead, I would commend another organization and their work, and that is SACRO. And they're, they're, they refer to their STOP, which was SACRO Tackling Offending Prejudice Services. And alternatives to, to, to prosecution that that could be, and the, uh, the, uh, the fact that early intervention to address this connected with education is the way ahead. So we will be supporting Mr Kelly. Thank you. I call Ian McCarthy, followed by Ben McPherson. Mr McArthur, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. When we had this debate in November 2016, I called for the government's discredited offensive behaviour at Football Act uh, to be sent for an early bath. On that occasion, Parliament agreed. And since then, for me, the evidence received by the Justice Committee uh, has by and large reinforced that view and I'm certainly grateful uh, to all those who took the time to share with us their insights on whatever side of the argument uh, they fell as well as to committee clerks, vice and indeed uh, committee colleagues. Of course, repeal of the Act is not an end in of itself. Efforts to combat the stain of sectar uh, sectarianism must be redoubled as indeed do our wider efforts to tr crack down on hate crime more generally. As the advisory group on tackling sectarianism made clear though, the foundations for change rest on initiatives that focus on prevention and building trust and understanding, recognising that councils, churches, football groups, schools, the media, community organisations, all are key in delivering effective grassroots solutions. And our stage one report puts up front our collective condemnation of sectarianism and hate crime. A consistent message, I believe, that's been sent out by this Parliament over its lifetime. But to those concerned that repeal dilutes or undermines that message, I offer reassurances that Scottish Liberal Democrats will always support effective evidence-based measures to tackle hate crime. What we will not do, however, is stand by while counterproductive quick fixes are put in place to garner headlines but which undermine genuine efforts to tackle these complex problems. I also struggle to accept that the wrong message is sent by repealing an act that, as we heard repeatedly, does not in fact provide the protections its supporters claim. We do no one any favours by leaving unchallenged that sort of false comfort and confidence, a view apparently shared by Bemis and the Coalition for Racial Equality. I'll give way to James, James Dornan. Dornan. But surely nobody's asking you to leave it unchallenged. Surely what people are asking you to do is suggest something to put in its place. To say that the only method of dealing with this is to repeal a bill and leave gaps, no matter what's been said from that side of the chamber, is surely wrong. Liam McArthur. I think Mr Dornan, with all due respect, has not listened to what it is that I've said. To provide false comfort and certainty through legislation that is ill-judged, that's mistargeted and is actually damaging those relationships seems to me something that Parliament should be resisting at all costs. A distinction I accept must be made between the nature and effect 
of sections 1 and section 6 of the 2012 Act. I have some sympathy for those concerned about repeal of the latter, and we'll come to this in due course. But no such qualms exist over repe uh, repeal of section 1. The reason, no doubt, that one judge described this Act as, quote, mince. Time and again, we heard criticism of the legislation as ill-conceived, a knee-jerk reaction to albeit reprehensible scenes at an old firm game and other serious incidents at the time. Railroaded through Parliament by a First Minister deaf to the concerns about a lack of compelling evidence that the tools at the disposal of the police, courts and our judicial system were inadequate. Deaf also to concerns about the impact the legislation would have, has had, on relationships between football fans and the police. Criminalising one section of society in one set of circumstances, no I won't, while leaving wide open what constitutes offensive behaviour was unjustified, illiberal and dubious in terms of human rights. Should it be repealed, there will be no gap in the law. Breach of the peace and other powers exist and will be used, as various expert witnesses told us, including uh, Police Scotland. You can address it in winding up, Minister. Plugging a gap that doesn't exist is that best gesture politics. And now faced with the prospect of defeat over repeal, SNP ministers offer talks on how best to clear up the mess they created, a desperate injury time bid to save face. Of course, Lord Brackadale's ongoing review is welcome and will help us uh, in the way we tackle the wider uh, hate crime uh, issues in future. The idea, however, that we should hold off taking action on the 2012 Act until Lord Brackadale has completed his report is misplaced. Indeed, I suspect it's not a view shared by Lord Brackadale himself. Even if he reports later th this year, his recommendations won't find their way into a draft bill, let alone onto the statute books for years. As I pointed out in committee, only now is the Civil Litigation Bill taking forward proposals in Sheriff Principal Taylor's 2013 report. Meantime, the damage being done by this illiberal piece of legislation, notably Section 1, demands attention. As I said earlier, though, Section 6 does present more nuanced uh, arguments. The provisions on threatening communications have the benefit, at least, of applying across the board rather than just to one section of society on one particular day. And while the powers haven't been greatly used, this uh, is more of a case for saying that a gap might exist upon repeal. The concerns of various religious groups appear to uh, relate more to Section 6, and I'm persuaded that at Stage 2 we do need to look at how uh, any repeal might be timed to avoid any hiatus. Deputy Presiding Officer, Parliament must again send out a strong message today that hate crime in all its forms is unacceptable. But this is achieved not by pretending that complex issues can be addressed through oversimplified solutions. The SNP's approach to legislation often seems to be summed up by the view that if the only tool you have is a hammer, you treat everything as if it were a nail. But to those who argue Please that supporters conclude. of repeal are apologists Thank you very for sectarianism, you're Please conclude. Wrong. I call Ben McPherson, we followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. And as a member of the Justice Committee, I'd also like to pass thanks on to colleagues, our clerks, and all the witnesses that gave evidence. President Officer, like many people in Scotland and around the world, I, I love football. I loved playing it growing up at primary school, secondary school, university, and club level. Uh, some of my friends were professionals, and I still really enjoy a kickabout and going to watch matches when I can. Football is absolutely a beautiful game, and everyone should be able to enjoy watching and playing it without experiencing offensive behaviour or intimidation. Although the majority of football fans are respectful and well behaved, football can of course have a negative and polarising effect on people in their communities and unfortunately that's still the case here in times in Scotland. Now, presiding officer, let me be clear, the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communication Scotland Act 2012, not the Football Act as it's been erroneously referred to, is not perfect and it's not a panacea. One thing that's become clear during the Justice Committee's recent deliberations on the current legislation is that the 2012 Act could certainly benefit from review and reform. However, what's equally clear is that repealing the 2012 Act without a viable alternative would be irresponsible and reckless because it is a useful set of powers for police and prose prosecutors. Uh, as law lecturer Andrew Tickle astutely said, Repealing the 2012 Act would be like using a sledgehammer for a task for which a scalpel is better devised. Joanne Lamont. Given that this Parliament voted a year ago to express its view that the bill should be repealed, is it not irresponsible of the Minister not to have brought a review of the legislation before now to address the concerns that you've got? Ben McPherson. Well, I think actually the meaningful and constructive thing to do 
is exactly what the government has to do, which is to conduct a review of hate crime legislation as a whole and then reflect on that evidence thereafter and look at how we can bring forward something comprehensively. Actually, the responsible thing to do is a reckless, it would be a reckless play in terms of full repeal of this act, which will leave a gap in the law in terms of section six. The position as I see it is that repealing the act would not be in the interest of the common good, uh, but neither would leaving the 2012 act unamended in its current form in the medium to long term. So in my view, we should be debating how to reform the 2012 Act and make it more effective. Uh, and that the repeal bill brought forward by Mr Kelly is a destructive measure and I will not be voting in favour of the principles of it today. If this bill does pass stage one, then he and many others may see it as scoring a crafty goal against the SNP like a poacher on the six yard line, but actually such populism is irresponsible and unhelpful. And, I would certainly, it, and it would certainly be irresponsible if his bill were rushed through and, and in good faith I ask him not to, to rush through it without adequate time for authorities to prepare for a post-2012 Act landscape. Presiding officer, there are many reasons to retain the current legislation. For example, it is supported by most people in Scotland. 83% support legislation to tackle offensive behaviour in football and 80% support the Act directly. Removing Section 6 would create a gap in the law, particularly in terms of the fact that uh, it criminalises threats made by the intent of citing religious hatred, uh, something which was not previously in, in Scots law, and also that Section 6 has extraterritorial application, which would be unavailable to prosecutors if the 2012 Act was repealed. Also, we should listen to stakeholder groups who have expressed concerns about repeal of the 2012 Act. And I could quote many from the evidence we've taken, but I'll just be very brief because my time is running out. In the words of the Church of Scotland, repealing the 2012 Act without replacement would be a symbol that our elected representatives do not think that behaving offensively or sending threatening communications is problematic. In the words of the Scottish Jewish communities, repeal of the Offensive Behaviour and Threatening Communications Act would send exactly the wrong message. Reform and amending the 2012 Act would make a meaningful and constructive difference. Repealing it without a viable alternative would be reckless and irresponsible. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by John Mason. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. And I think, firstly, uh, it's important to recognise that although progress has been made in recent years, Scotland does have an issue with sectarianism as well as other offensive behaviours, as has been highlighted in this debate. And those of us who have witnessed first-hand old firm matches over the years, as well as other football matches, cannot fail to be aware of the kind of behaviour that we are discussing today. And the reality is, of course, that this behaviour is not confined to the terraces. And let's be clear from the outset, this behaviour is not only unwelcome and unacceptable in a modern Scotland, but also the law states that any such behaviour that causes personal offence, be it sectarianism, homophobic or racially motivated, is a breach. And as such, the perpetrators can and should be charged appropriately. However, the knee-jerk reaction after a particularly fiery old firm game by the then First Minister Alex Salmond when he said that something must be done led to legislation that is poorly written and therefore difficult to enforce in law. And we all agree... In I'll, I'll, I'll take Annabel Ewing. I'm very grateful to the member. I, I think it's important to re remember and recall that, of course, the game to which he refers was not the catalyst, but in fact was the tip of the iceberg. And, and we saw also, of course, the sending of explosive devices through the post to raise figures, and we saw death threats against Neil Lennon and so on. I think that's important to just remember the context here. Brian Whittle. I think what we're talking about here is the context of, of, of offensive behaviour, which is uh, sectarianism specifically within uh, the old, old firm matches has been going on for a very long time. And what I'm suggesting to you is that progress has been made. And we still have some way to go, but progress has been made. And I think, as I said before, I think that that kind of behaviour at football, uh, as in any other situation, is reprehensible and should be dealt with as such. The ma but no matter the good intentions or otherwise of the First Minister, bad law is bad law. And where the implementation of law is problematic, it has to be questioned. Its relevance has to be questioned, especially where the law already caters for these issues. The offensive behaviour at football focus on, focuses on behaviours at spe a specific event, 
The reality, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that this kind of behaviour is a societal issue and not specific to football. And by singling out that kind of behaviour over that 90 minutes of sport, I believe detracts from the overarching issue. We all agree that this has to be tackled. But where there is a law already applicable, the focus should be on how we better address, educate and change that behaviour in our schools, in our playgrounds and our communities. The fact that this kind of behaviour manifests itself in a more focused and public way when crowds of people turn up at a football ground and shout at each other for 90 minutes while a football match is going on in the background shouldn't disguise the fact that it goes on in our communities just the same. Should we be asking football clubs to do more? Absolutely. They have a significant part to play and that should be an ongoing process. Should we attempt to single out and disproportionately penalise a certain section of society because we can? and perhaps because it highlights that we're at least attempting to do something? I believe not. And if we agree that policing by consent is desirable, then I also believe that the 2012 Act is contrary to that ethos. Police on the ground are finding it difficult to consistently apply, and if that is the case, it is time to have a rethink. As the bill was progressing through Parliament, as has already been said, opposition parties were critical of the bill, believing that the legislation was unfair, unworkable and inconsistent. With the bill now in place, this consensus has been reflected on the ground by those who have, an, have to attempt to implement this law. Rosanna Cunningham, the then Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, said quite rightly the critical role of government is to ensure that the law is fit for purpose. But when a senior judge said that the legislation was, and I quote, horribly drafted, and that the Act specifically instructs judges to completely ignore the actual context, context in which the behaviour takes place, and that it was perverse, it is obvious that the bill has missed the mark set by Rosanna Cunningham. Now, uh, there is a worry that scrapping this act will send a message that this kind of behaviour is somehow acceptable. I would argue that by targeting football supporters specifically, uh, it actually helps to per uh, perpetuate sectarianism. And I, I was reminded actually recently of, uh, um, uh, we recently lost a pioneer in tackling racism in sport in, in Cyril Regis during the late uh, 70s, uh, uh, him and two of his cohorts, Laurie Cunningham and Brendan Batson, uh, uh, were part of a, a, a football club at West Bromwich Albion where the, and on the terracing, uh, uh, racism was rife and obvious. But however, through a sort of enduring education and positive reinforcement, uh, that kind of blatant racism is unthinkable uh, today and, and change can be made without the need for this kind of legislation. And I would argue that an educational approach is far more effective. Deputy Presiding Officer, it's entirely right that this Parliament should uh, vigorously pursue methods to eradicate hate crimes for good wherever they occur, in fact, actually before they occur. However, if the Act is ineffective against its objectives and when human rights of the Act are brought into question, it is time for a rethink. Bad law is bad law and the SNP Government needs to heed the, the mounting evidence and repeal this Act. Thank you. I call John Mason to be followed by Johan Lamont. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, we're clearly debating a very hot topic today, covering offensive behaviour at football, but we're also touching on issues from 500 years ago with the Reformation and subsequent wars and persecution of a whole range of people throughout Europe in the name of Christianity. So can I first say how disappointing it is that sectarianism and related issues have developed, despite the fact that Jesus himself prayed that his followers would be one united in their love and commitment to him. I think we should acknowledge that in the west of Scotland, there has been a history of sectarianism, anti-Catholicism and anti-Irish racism. The Catholic or Irish minority has been badly treated and that has left scars and we cannot ignore that as we move forward. As has been said in the past, this is a subject Scotland has been nervous talking about and I would pay tribute to Donald Gorry of the Lib Dems and Jack McConnell of Labour who have said that we must face up to this issue uh, since the parliament was re-established in 1999. So after a period of less activity for a while, the SNP felt we had to do something, and I think that was absolutely correct. Clearly, the previous common statutory law was not working, and I fully support the decision that legislation was needed. However, I do accept that the bill was too rushed. A problem of 500 years standing could not be sorted in one year. And I also accept that I, as a backbencher, should probably have questioned the timescale. However, I was new in 2011, and I failed to do that. But we are where we are now, and as the committee itself heard, there is a danger that repeal it sends out the message that any songs, 
any chants, any expressions of hatred are acceptable at football. Uh, yes, OK. Neil Finlay. And that's exactly the point. That when you have an unquestioning group of backbenchers who never question anything, we, we bring in bad law. John Mason. Uh, well, I think uh, if, if the member knew me, he would know that I have questioned a few things, and both the present and the previous uh, First Ministers have had me in their offices shouting at me. But uh, to move on, uh, one, point, one point I certainly agree with in the report is that there should be a definition of sectarianism. By sectarianism, I'm including anti-Irish racism and anti-Catholicism, but it's a bit of a mouthful to say every time. And I felt the definition of Duncan Morrow's advisory group was very good, especially in their interim report. Now, I'd like to deal with one or two points that have been raised with me during this process. One, why is football targeted? Well, I think one of the answers for that is that 88% of the public, when asked about sectarianism, link it with football. And secondly, because I would suggest that some people do behave worse at football than they do in other parts of their lives. I myself attend football, and I see folk who appear to behave very well elsewhere behaving a lot worse at matches. No, I'm sorry, I've taken one. I see fans being ejected from games and sometimes suspended by a club, including my own Clyde, but whom I think could easily have been charged. So I think this legislation has been enforced extremely leniently, not least because the police cannot be expected to wade in and arrest 10,000 fans. And in this regard, I think Rangers and Celtic fans have been treated more leniently compared to fans at smaller clubs who are easier to deal with. The recent incident of throwing plastic eyeballs onto the pitch to mock a disabled player does suggest that behaviour at football is worse and does need to be targeted. Two, something cannot be allowed in one place but not another. That's wrong. We allow drinking inside, but we do not allow drinking out in the street. Alcohol is allowed in many places after 9pm, but is not allowed on trains. So if we have a problem in a particular place, like at football, it is perfectly reasonable to tackle it at that place. Three, education is enough. Well, I do agree that education is part of the answer and a very important part. A book like Theresa Breslin's Divided City is great. It's used in schools and I've seen it performed by youngsters at the Citizens Theatre. But education has not worked and I fear will not work without legislation as well. Smoking and alcohol abuse have needed legislation as well as education, and I am convinced that sectarianism and hatred need legislation too. Four, what about marches? Well, I do agree that marches, in particular orange marches, do encourage hatred as well. The whole atmosphere in Glasgow is poisonous on the day of big orange marches, and therefore I do hope that Lord Brackadale's wider review of hatred will cover the issue of marches as well. Five, is freedom of speech not important? Yes, freedom of speech is important. It's a great uh, right, but it's not unfettered. Six, the Offensive, offensive Behaviour at F Football Act is vague, but it's a lot less vague than breach of the peace. Presiding officer, this act is not perfect. It has had some success in people being charged and in sending out a message that expressions of hatred, sectarianism, anti-Catholicism and anti-Irish racism are not acceptable in modern 2018 society. We take a grave risk of moving backwards if we repeal it, and I strongly oppose James Kelly's bill. Thank you. Joanne Lamont, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I say that I'm happy to speak in this important debate? I should declare an interest. I'm a Celtic season ticket holder. My brother and his family are Rangers supporter. And for good measure, there is no greater fan of Kingsley, the Partick Thistle mascot, than I am. I love football and many people across this country love football and are paying attention to this debate today. I was Labour's justice spokesperson when the debate on this bill emerged as a consequence of events at Rangers Celtic game. It was that specific. The then First Minister said he would legislate by the start of the new season. A good soundbite, I guess, but soon it hardened into an impossible timetable with poor legislation developed with little thought and even less clarity. And despite all the reservations which came from across the chamber, including SNP backbenchers, the First Minister did pause, but then chose to dig in rather than reach out to others who were concerned about football. Now, I don't believe that there is anyone in this chamber who wants to celebrate sectarianism, who 
look, who wants to hear racist or sexist or homophobic abuse at football or anywhere else, or would want to deny anyone protection from that abuse. So this is not a debate about who cares most about that abuse. It's a matter of judgment seriously addressed. It's a judgment about whether this legislation makes things better or worse. And I, as someone who's fought all my life for equality, take the view that it makes things worse. This is also not a bubble debate where we can somehow practice our outrage and demonise each other. The truth is this bill is here not because of party interest, but because out there in the real world, many, many serious people oppose it, have been victims of its lack of clarity or who see it as illiberal and ineffective. Members can demonise me, but they ought not to dismiss this astonishingly broad coalition of people who want it repealed. And I notice that some have sought to personalise this to James Kelly, that he is irresponsible in taking this forward. Now, I agree James Kelly should not need to be doing this. For any responsible Scottish government worthy of its name, seeing the injustices perpetrated in its name through this legislation, and given the widespread opposition to it in the Parliament and outside, would have already acted to repeal it themselves and ensure there was a safety net if they perceived there to be a gap. <laughs> there is no shame in admitting you got it wrong, but there is shame in obdurately refusing to listen. Now, the strongest argument made that I have heard against repeal is that it sends a message. But my problem is that it's not clear what that message is. For some, it sends very mixed messages. In truth, it's difficult to know how to avoid prosecution under the legislation. I can say something in here without harm, but if I said it at a football match, I could be prosecuted. I could say something in the pub with a television on showing the football, and I could be prosecuted, but if somebody had switched it to the tennis, I could not be prosecuted. For all too many football fans, it sends out an all too clear message that football fans are uniquely offensive given to racist, sectist, sectarian and homophobic abuse. Now, football fans, in truth, reflect our society and we should be tackling abuse wherever it occurs. The abuse is the issue, not the venue. So how do we get change? By understanding how football has already changed. When I was young, I hate to tell the younger people here, Scottish football fans were horrible. The Tartan Army transformed that into a group who are willing to celebrate football without being abusive. When I was young, I watched Mark Walters, Rangers' first black player at Celtic Park. I was ashamed to see Celtic fans throwing bananas onto the pitch, and indeed my own husband wrote to Celtic View to insist that fans desist. That would not happen now, partly by education, partly by the enforcement of the law, but also because football them fans, themselves chose to act, to take on those who shamed their clubs and shamed their country. And as a woman uh, at the football, I see football has changed immeasurably. We can work with fans, we can work with the police to put in measures that will support decent fans who simply want to enjoy a game. This bill does the opposite. People don't even know when they go to a match whether what they're doing is prosecutable or not. And the Scottish Government sends another mixed message. It clings to a bill that does not work, but at the same time has systematically stripped out funding from the very organisations that will tackle sectarianism, bigotry and abuse. The work that needs to be done in our communities to root out these attitudes. These you programmes must come are gone to a close, and all we're left is with the bill and its title creating difficulty in our communities. I will support its repeal at the end because I believe in that way we're doing football in this country and the people who go there and our broader communities you must close, are please. the best service. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by John Scott. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Justice Committee that has scrutinised this bill at stage one, we had a wide range of evidence, and I want to put on record my thanks to all who gave evidence, and of course the clerks in the report, as others have said, including James Kelly, was very well written and captured all the main points. 
As an Albion Rover supporter attending games with attendances of around 400 people and with the police officer on duty that day takes the time to speak to fans in a normally fr family friendly environment, this process of scrutiny has been of great interest to me. I think it's important to note, as an MSP not elected when the 2012 Act first went through, what we are being asked to scrutinise here. And, J and John Finney touched on this. We are being asked not if we should implement this law, but rather should we repeal it. So I approach the evidence gathering in that manner, thinking about the repercussions of repeal without anything else being in place as proposed by James Kelly. The constituency I represent, unfortunately, like much of Central and West Scotland, has been blighted with the curse of sectarianism. We can't deny that and we should never shirk away from trying to tackle it and I applaud all members of the Chamber for addressing that today in their speeches. And football does have a role in this. I have many friends and family who will not take their children to Celtic Park or Ibrox because of perceived behaviours they may be exposed to by a minority of fans. I myself am now a second generation of a family without religious ties and I think that this came about as a result of my, the wedding of my grandparents in 1952. My gran, a Roman Catholic from Ireland, who with her family had settled in Cope Bridge, and my granddad, a Protestant, also from Cope Bridge. Apparently, this wedding caused a few shockwaves at the time, but I just like to think of them as Cope Bridge's Romeo and Juliet of their generation. But to say whether you're part of it or not, sectarianism affects everyone in every part of Civic Scotland. From offensive remarks on Facebook, to running battles in Whifflet Main Street on match day, to those saddening scenes of flag waving on the 19th of September 2014, in George's Square against a backdrop of flares and police mounted in horseback. So when this leg legislation was passed, I thought, great, something that can help tackle the problem, not solve it, not solve it at all, but start to tackle it. And I have to say, when I heard the evidence for repeal, I was surprised at the strength of it, because heritage is important, culture is important, and so is freedom of speech. I believe in all of these things too, and I pay tribute to all of those who gave evidence and made this case. Funds Against Criminalisation, Bemis, Stuart Reagan from the SFA, amongst others. But equally, we heard compelling evidence to retain the bill, because laws must be made to protect. From the likes of Stonewall Scotland, as have been mentioned, the Scottish Disabled Supporters Association, and the Scottish Women's Convention, again, amongst many others. And many of these organisations represented minority groups, and were extremely concerned about the impact the repeal of the legislation would have, and what message it would send out. And I know that some of my colleagues have talked about the content of their evidence. Therefore, on balance, I'm of mind to vote for retaining the Act and against the repeal tonight. There was evidence, albeit conflicting, as has been teased out from different witnesses, that there would be a gap in the law, particularly around Section 6, and that we would be failing to protect the majority of football fans and the wider public more generally. And the majority of those who gave evidence on both sides of the debate indicated that they would prefer to delay any repeal until after Lord Brackadale's review. However, as the convener has said, after some debate, the committee agreed unanimously not to delay, um, to be fair to the review, and because there was no time limit. But I think it is worth pointing out that both uh, groups of, that were given evidence, there was a majority for, um, for leaving it. This was not an easy position to reach, I have to say, uh, as I've outlined, as there was persuasive arguments on both sides. And I will draw you to the section uh, to this particular section of stage one of the report, uh, which has already been mentioned. The minority who voted against the general principles of the bill are of the view that the, should the 2012 Act be retained, the Scottish Government should revisit the 2012 Act and bring forward constructive amendments. And I think that Ben McPherson and Mary Goujon have made that point very, very clear. Because this is because myself and my colleagues believe they were not simply in favour of retention for retention's sake, but have the stance that rather than repeal the bill, the government should amend it to take on board the many concerns, particularly around section one, and ultimately make it a better law that works, because that's what we all want. Presiding officer, I do want to discuss quickly the issue that James Kelly had mentioned that I tried to intervene on in his remarks. Uh, it's come up in evidence as well of young people, perhaps with no history um, of convictions, picking up um, offences through this act. And as someone with a background in criminal justice, social work, and indeed youth justice, this did worry me somewhat, particularly as the Scottish Government had made funding available for a diversion scheme through the organisation SACRO. And under this Justice Secretary, more emphasis has been put on restorative and diversionary uh, justice um, from, from prosecution. Sorry. However, I'm also clear that this is an issue not of the Act itself and should not be argued as a reason to repeal. 
It is an issue of implementation and of court and local services and prosecutors known what diversion schemes are available. If the repeal is agreed to, which seems a probable outcome, then we must get on with respecting that democratic will and implementing the outcome. I know the Scottish Government will take the steps to make sure that we can continue to tackle sectarianism in the period post-act. If, however, it is retained, I think those with concerns can be assured that the Government would be strongly encouraged to revisit and improve the legislation as set out by the SNP members in committee. Thanks. I call John Scott to be followed by James Dornan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by welcoming the Stage 1 debate today and congratulate James Kelly, MSP, in bringing this repeal bill forward to Parliament. Can I also thank the Justice Committee for their hard work on this bill and note at the outset that the Justice Committee has backed the general principles of the repeal bill. I welcome their work at their Stage 1 report on what is essentially post-legislative scrutiny on the 2012 Act and their report is not kind to the Scottish Government and this Act is perhaps the classic case in legislative terms of the SNP Government acting in haste and repenting at leisure. I have a deal of sympathy for Rosanna Cunningham, MSP, who was charged by her colleagues to get a bill on the statute book, get it done quickly, and then the SNP majority government of the day just rammed it through Parliament. And I share Joanne Lamont's recollections of the shortened timescales that were demanded of her. Because the flaws in this bill were manifest at the time and were well documented in Parliament then and since. And the sound of wings flapping over Holyrood recently is merely the chickens coming home to roost on this poorly thought out piece of legislation. When SNP members of the Justice Committee, and here I quote directly from the Stage 1 report, are of the view that should the 2012 Act be retained, the Scottish Government should revisit the 2012 Act and bring forward constructive amendment, that tells you that even the SNP members accept that this Act is not fit for purpose. And they are not alone in their condemnation. And here we as parliamentarians also have to thank those who provided the 286 submissions to the Justice Committee in its call for evidence. Because 227 of those submissions were in favour of repeal of the 2012 Act. That is 227 out of 286 which is almost 80% of the respondents who wanted to see this act repealed. I'm sorry I don't have time, Minister. You'll be able to make your remarks in your winding up speech. But condemnation of this act was not limited to submissions on the call for evidence by the committee. Over 3,200 football clubs and members of the public took part in James Kelly's Members' Bill consultation and 71 of those respondents backed repeal of section 1 to 5, while 62% supported the repeal of sections 6 to 9. So, presiding officer, this is post-legislative scrutiny in action, and today our party will be supporting the repeal of this legislation. Of course, if no other law were available to deal with bad behaviour at football matches, then perhaps a case could be made for amending this bill but this is manifestly not the case with sufficient pre-existing law in place to cover the type of behaviour targeted by the 2012 Act. And this is not only the view of the Scottish Conservatives, but also the view of the Law Society of Scotland. Of course, if there was no other legislation to deal with incitement to religious hatred, then perhaps again a case would be made for amending this bill. But Professor Fiona Leverick told the Justice Committee that if someone behaves in a threatening manner or makes a threat, that would be covered by Section 38 of the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010. So two key elements of the bill were not, re not required in the first place. And to be frank, the 2012 Act was brought forward as a knee-jerk response to satisfy the government's view that something needed to be done at that time, when sufficient pre-existing legislation was in place to deal with complaints before it was introduced and since. So, Presiding Officer, if this bill is repealed, we need to look to the future and develop a view on how we deal with the type of behaviour which the Minister herself acknowledges still continues, notwithstanding the 2012 Act being in place, and which she defends, but which self-evidently isn't working. As with many problems, other problems, educating children and young people early in life is one of the most obvious ways of eliminating sectarianism and abusive behaviour. And that is not only about telling children and young people that sectarianism and abusive behaviour is a bad thing. 
What it is about is about teaching young people tolerance and that others are entitled to their views, even if those views are at odds with their own. And that comes from an understanding of history, an understanding of evolution or social justice, and an understanding of the needs of others as well as your own. Presiding officer, the Scottish legal landscape would be a better place without this poorly thought out piece of legislation and I hope Parliament tonight supports this view. Thank you. The final contribution in the open debate is from James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, in my view, repealing this Act is an error of massive proportions. Whatever your view of the Act, the message sent out here by repeal plays into every ancient stereotype of the sectarian, drunken Scot who only wants to drink and fight. It damages the reputation of Scottish football, Scotland and this Scottish Parliament. Now, I know that this is not what the Greens intend and expect, although I think they're massively wrong. They're voting for what they think is the right reason, flawed leg legislation and other reasons. I also accept there are some in those benches who would be concerned about that, although for some it appears self-interest and or the chance to kick the government is far more important. On these benches here, this plays right into their hands. There are many who would be happy to see this place treated with contempt and derision, and I fear that will be the consequence of this decision. We were contacted by someone who said, my office was, said that legislation is often used to indicate the kind of society in which we want to be try, try to be. I agree, and I cringe when I think of what society people think we want Scotland to be if we vote to repeal this act today. We've heard a lot today about this piece of legislation only targeting football fans. It's nonsense. It targets people who break the law. In most civilised societies, what happens then is we try to change the behaviours of those that break the law. Here, what seems to be the case is if you get a well-organised, influential, apparently well-funded group of people who can wield some political clout, you can get a compliant politician to fight to change the law on your behalf. We also have Daniel Johnson, a Labour MSP, bringing out a member's bill protecting retail workers from attack. A very sensible move, which I hope I'm able to support. However, why is he bringing it forward when there are already laws in place to deal with assault? Because he sees special circumstances around the safety of shopkeepers. Pretty much the same as we see special circumstances around the behaviour at football. We also hear a lot about spending money on education. The SNP government has spent more than any previous administration on exactly that. What good, though, is spending money through education and other methods from Monday to Friday if the same young kid then goes to the football on a Saturday and hears people call his dad a Fenian or an Orange Bee? All that good work is heading out the window because we think that behaviour is no longer worthy of our attention. I saw online someone accusing Null by Mouth of being untrustworthy because they received funding from the Scottish Government. That idiot should hang his head in shame, particularly given the circumstances in which no by mouth came about in the first place. Last Saturday, FAC had a meeting to discuss the Act. It was at first reported that the meeting was cancelled because two Rangers casuals came to the meeting and wouldn't promise to behave. The person who chaired the meeting denied this, and I believe him, However, he went on to say that the police were called because these two Ranger supporters were there and wouldn't behave. So, a meeting called about a law that doesn't let the people sing calls the police because of, of a fear of the wrong kind of singing taking place. You couldn't make it up, and unfortunately, we don't have to. <laughs> well, I've got it in my Twitter, so... I'm not sure when or how one group of fans got to dictate to the rest... The, the, uh, to, I'm not sure when or how one group of fans got to dictate to the rest the criteria for being a Celtic fan. I've been one for nearly 60 years, saw them in both the long barn spells as a young child before Steen came and through the McCarry and Brady years. And yet apparently I no longer qualify for this unique club because I oppose their right to bring sectarian songs and songs about terrorism and the loss of innocent lives, including many Irish people, into the stadium. I sang these songs. I sang them when I was a teenager during the 60s and early 70s. But times change. The situation in Ireland changed and I got older. Back then you could smoke in a bus, be in a car without wearing a seatbelt and ride a motorbike without wearing a helmet. But you couldn't, for example, be openly gay. That was still against the law in Scotland. 
And what I'm saying is, times change. It appears some football fans don't. So when, or if, you make your decision to take us back to the 70s tonight at 5 p.m., just remember what it was like back then. Last week, a member of my staff was delivering my annual reports when one particularly irate constituent came charging out his door, scrunched up the annual report and shouted to him, I'd never vote for that effing Celtic supporter, IRA-loving Fenian C. That's how far we still have to go. And repealing this act will send out the message that we're not really bothered about getting there. And I'll tell you something else. If you're serious about this, and this, this legislation passes tonight, well, I, I hope then that you'll support my members' debate and strict liability, my members' bill and strict liability, because if not, then you're not serious at all. Presiding officer, to finish, the 11-year-old daughter of a member of my staff heard her mother and I discussing this debate last night. She later said to her mum, Mum, the bottom line is this. In years to come, will the Labour man be able to put his head in the pillow knowing he's changed the lives of wee kids like me or will he be really sad that he could have changed history and he didn't? Out of the mouth of children. Eh. We now move to the closing debate and I call Neil Finlay. Six minutes, please, Mr Finlay. Uh, President officer, I used to be a football fan. The game used to give me great pleasure. There's nothing like the excitement of a big match with a full house. Uh, and the, the high and ultimately very low point for me was following Scotland to the 1990 World Cup. I, I still come out in a sweat every time I hear Costa Rica mentioned. But the football that I enjoyed has changed. The growing chasm between those who play the game uh, and own the teams and the fans who spend their hard-earned wages attending matches is, I believe, a real danger to the future sustainability of clubs in the game. <coughs> Excuse me. The vast amounts of money that's flooded into football uh, hasn't made the game more competitive in Scotland, it's just made it ever more predictable. And the experience of fans, the lifeblood of the game, uh, come a long way behind advertising and soaring ticket prices, merchandising and TV revenues. And for it's for these reasons that I personally have fallen out of love with football. But I accept that being part of a crowd of people at any cultural event can be an exciting, good-humoured and an ex exhilarating experience. But on other occasions, it can be ugly, especially when peer pressure and aggressive, a, an aggressive crowd mentality takes hold. But let me be clear, I loathe bigotry, sectarianism and racism. This was drummed into me by my parents from an early age. Detesting everything about sectarianism is one of the things my late father instilled in me and I thank him for having done that. So as we debate the repeal of this act, my main reason for supporting James Kelly's proposals are not rooted in football. They're root rooted in defending the rights of my constituents and the rights of my class. Because ever, ever since the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act was introduced, the response from fam fans, the legal profession and rights groups have been negative and persistent. I do not re support the repeal just for opposition's sake. It's about defending the rights of people who choose to go and watch a sport but have their rights removed for doing so. The, the act, in a moment, the act as it stands, in the main, criminalises young working class men because of something they do inside or on the way to a football match, but that very same behaviour in other circumstances would go either unpunished or would be dealt with under a different law. James Dornan. I thank Mr Finlay for taking the intervention. Will he accept that the, the vast majority of the crowd should, it should be allowed to enjoy the game without listening to the sectarian singing that we hear at many grounds across Scotland? Absolutely. Neil Finlay. And the, the Offensive Behaviour Act seeks to impose a set of values on individuals who are deemed by that act to begin engaging in activities that are distasteful. This, in my view, is straightforward class prejudice. Now, George, George Adam... George Adam, in a ludicrous contribution, said that any song not about football shouldn't be sung at a football ground. No sun, sit down, Mr Adam, no thank you. Sunshine on Leith, banned from Easter Road. Penny Arcade, banned from Ibrox. And Just Can't Get Enough, banned from Park, Celtic Park. Now, I am not the biggest Depeche Mode fan, Mr Adam, but I think one of their early singles should not be classified as offensive and the singer arrested for doing so. Presiding officer, we should seek to address sectarianism across society as a whole so that young people grow up learning to be tolerant, empathetic and respectful. The overwhelming majority of them are. 
We are more likely, likely to tackle sectarianism through education and cultural change, through our schools and colleges and youth work. We are more likely to tackle it by continuing to fund anti-sectarianism projects, not by demonising young working class football supporters. And, President Officer, there is a certain political and media class that have never liked football fans or the influence fan culture has. And I accept that that culture has at times crossed the line, but incidents are relatively few, and most football fans are law-abiding and conscientious citizens. When it does cross the line, the law already exists to deal with it. But, President Officer, I said earlier, for me, this is not, not about football. It's about the fundamental right to be equal before the law, to lose that equality and your rights because you walk through the door of a football stadium but not a rugby stadium or a theatre or a pop festival shows the absurdity of the Act. The Act was passed without the support of other parties. The first time this has happened, it is not fit for purpose. The police have been unable to implement the law. The courts are unclear on how to deal with offenders. And the trust and relationship between football fans and the police has been undermined. The Offensive Behaviour at Football Act was introduced too quickly without due consideration for the outcomes it would have on the lives of those it would affect. President officer, we must address bigotry and sectarianism and intolerance in our society. But this was never the way to go about it. This is an experiment that has failed, and it's time for the government to admit it was wrong. And if they do, I will applaud them. I would applaud them for their honesty. And I'm sure thousands of football fans and many other of our citizens would do the same. I commend James Kelly for introducing this bill. He has my support and the support of my party. And I make an appeal to SNP backbenchers who know this is bad law, who know this should never have been introduced, not to vote by what your whips tell you, but to vote with your conscience and reject what the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act and support Mr Kelly's bill. Just before I call Mr Lindhurst, can I remind members that this isn't a football match? Mr Lindhurst, six minutes, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, yet again we have debated the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. The Conservatives have been opposed to the 2012 Bill since it was rushed through this Parliament, and we remain opposed to it today. It was an ill-thought-out reactionary piece of legislation which, when viewed in the best light, was intended to deal with a problem recognized by us all. But it is an unnecessary law, as the law already in existence fully provided for crimes for charging those guilty of any of the offenses under this new law. The appropriate approach to dealing with a recognized problem is not always the creation of a new criminal law. As Anthony Horan of the Catholic Parliamentary Office was correct in saying that, and I quote, we need to do more than simply throw legislation at the problem. Education can play a large part in addressing the issue of unacceptable sectarian behavior. And my colleague, Morris Corey, talked about taking that fight to our homes, classrooms, and communities where we can change culture and attitudes. And in evidence given to the committee, we were told that there is significant scope to improve the use of interventions such as STOP the cognitive behavioral program that helps people think about their own attitudes and how to change them. Liam Kerr reiterated the evidence given by the Law Society of Scotland about all 287 charges brought under Section 1 of the Act in 2015 to 16 that could have been brought under pre-existing legislation. The Act is unnecessary and it unfairly targets a section of society. It is an example of producing law for the sake of it, rather than enforcing the law that already exists. The minister herself pointed out to the committee that, and I quote, football is not an island on its own where people are free to do as they choose without any need to consider the wider aspect of their behaviors. Aggressive behavior that is deemed acceptable at football will simply be carried into other areas of life. Well, it is ironic that the SNP government have created that island and placed football supporters on it, ignoring the fact that such behaviors can and do occur in other areas of life, irrespective of football interests or allegiances. 
Certainly. Annabel Ewing. Um, I, I, I'd heard it suggested this afternoon in the debate that you know there's no real problem now and the huge problems were before and whilst there's still some problem, it's not of a big order. Can I just remind members uh, that uh, a man pled guilty to charges uh, under the Act for shouting, making racist gestures, a monkey gesture to Scott Sinclair, a Celtic player, during a Celtic Rangers match on the 29th of April 2017. This is still a very current problem. Gordon Lintersh. <clears throat> Yes, no one is suggesting it's not a problem. What we're saying is this act will not solve it and is not addressing the problem. How is it fair to treat football supporters travelling to Tynecastle differently to rugby supporters travelling to Murrayfield? And on this, and no I won't, I'm afraid. On this I would echo Neil Findlay's comments because surely this is socially divisive. And what is clear is that there has been a negativity and demonization brought about by the Offensive Behaviour Act, and it has resulted in distrust between fans and the police that we've heard about already today. Police officers are themselves placed in an unenviable position by all of this. One of the key criticisms of the 2012 Act was about the need for application of the Section 1 offence by police officers, meaning that they required to place themselves in the position of that notional reasonable person who would be offended by certain behaviour. Or, as the 2012 Act, Section 1, Subsection 2E itself fails to define other behaviour. Now, that is not a definition. That is a nonsense, an absurdum. We are, none of us, mind readers. And for anyone second-guessing what might happen in another person's head in the event that they hypothetically were present somewhere they were not, presents a total mind maze. Now, Danny Boyle of Bemis put it well, in my opinion, when he said, police officers are, and I quote, not anthropologists, sociologists, or political commentators. So the act is a difficult piece of legislation for them to implement. I would say that would apply to most of us. And Jeanette Findlay of Fans Against Criminalization stated, and again I quote, it should raise alarm bells that police officers have to be trained to discover what might be offensive. Now those complexities result in instances we've heard about today already and another example such as the Rangers fan arrested for holding a banner reading Acts the Act. Such an interpretation places us in dangerous waters already in the realms of restricting free speech. How are fans themselves to know what the act does and does not criminalize? Supporters Direct said that, quote, there is generally a lot of ambiguity about what constitutes a criminal offense under the act. Well, we can say that again. Inventing a reasonable person and thereby an arbitrary threshold as to what are, is or is not offensive is itself in this context an unacceptable limit on freedom of expression. Indeed, Dr. Stuart Waiton said that the act, quotes, criminalizes words and thoughts. So section one is a hideous construction and repeal would not be a crafty goal for James Kelly as Ben McPherson su suggested. Rather, I would say that the refusal to repeal it is an own goal for the SNP. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is time, it is time to scrap the Act. I call Annabelle Ewing. Uh Eight minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Today we have heard a lot about the supposed problems with the Act and a great deal of enthusiasm to repeal it with scant regard for the impact that this will have. Repealing the Act will have consequences. And these consequences are not just around the ability to charge people for their behaviour at and around football or not, the real consequences will be felt by those who fear attending football matches because they feel exposed to those who interpret repeal as freedom to be abusive within a football environment, such as the 46% of LGBT people Stonewall Scotland tell us feel unwelcome at sporting uh, events. And the real consequences will be felt by the whole of society as unchallenged offensive language wears away the sense of identity and belonging that our communities should rightly feel, undermining cohesion and isolating one community from another through fear of being abused. This hateful and prejudicial behaviour does have a corrosive impact on the people and communities being targeted. 
Offensive behaviour is not harmless and it is not victimless. On the 18th of January of this year, the Scotsman newspaper editorial stated, and I quote, changing any society's values for the better is a hard thing to do, but it is important for democratically elected politicians to recognise they have a leadership role and to make the direction of travel clear. If the Scottish Parliament does decide to repeal the Act, MSPs will need to think very carefully about the presentation of this decision. No one should be left in any doubt that offensive sectarian behaviour at football will not be tolerated. Much of the discussion on the Act focuses on the impact it has on a minority of football supporters and their rights to sing and do as they please during a match. But what about the vast majority of football supporters and the rest of society? And can I just say, uh, is it not rather insulting to suggest that it is working class people that are the ones who wish to sing sectarian yeah. songs as Mr Finlay did? Yeah. As I have said before, football is not something that is separate from everything else in society. Indeed, an island off on its own where no one has to worry about what happens there. It is absolutely built into the fabric of Scottish society. It is indeed Scotland's national game. And that means that it has responsibilities beyond the stadium. The influence of football cuts across the whole of society. And what happens there influences how people behave towards each other in other areas of society. When abusive language and behaviour goes unchallenged, it simply becomes the norm. And that is harmful to all of society. The Justice Committee's report on the bill highlighted the widespread support for legislation from key groups. And it's worth reminding ourselves, perhaps, of some of these uh, comments. Chris Oswald of the Equality and Human Rights Commission said, we must note that protections for disabled people and trans people would be lost if the Act were to be repealed. And there is, at this point, no prospect of their reintroduction. Colin McFarlane from Stonewall, Scotland, told the committee that the Act sends a clear message that abusive behaviour at football is not acceptable. And, and I quote, repealing the Act without putting other measures in place, could undermine work that has been undertaken by organisations such as Stonewall Scotland, the Equality Network, football clubs, Police Scotland and the Criminal Justice Agencies to increase LGBT people's confidence, not only in reporting uh, hate crime, but in attending sporting events such as football. The Reverend Ian Galloway of the Church of Scotland said, I'll take an intermission. Liam MacArthur. To the, to the Minister, she's quite right in the evidence that uh, she relays from Stonewall and others, but um, she's, I think, ignoring the evidence we heard from ACC Higgins. In the absence of this bill, other laws would be used to enforce uh, the, the, the law and to crack down on, on, on this behaviour. Is she no confidence in ACC Higgins? Annabel Ewing. I think it's clear from the evidence that the, the member is well aware of that was submitted to the committee uh, that there are concerns uh, that there will be constraints on what uh, uh, can be done in terms of the uh, uh, abilities of the prosecuting authorities to tackle some of this behaviour. And that evidence is very clearly set forth uh, in the uh, uh, evidence uh, official reports of the Justice Committee. But I was uh, saying, uh, Presiding Officer, that the Reverend Ian Galloway of the Church of Scotland said, and I quote, we think that there is a danger of sending the message by the simple repeal of the Act that we are not taking seriously enough such behaviours and attitudes. Much of the criticism of the Act centres around the criminalisation of behaviour that is otherwise offensive to a reasonable person. Since April 2012, there have been a total of 196 charges under this category. The majority of the charges under the Act, 823 charges, have been for threatening behaviour. That is, people fighting and engaging in violent behaviour. There has also been, have also been 405 charges for hateful behaviour, including racist, homophobic or sexist abuse. As I said in my opening statement, if the will of Parliament is to support the principles of the repeal bill, then it is incumbent on the Scottish government to look at how the impact of this foolhardy action can be minimised to ensure that communities currently protected by the Act do not suddenly find themselves with no protection. If there is any party that wishes to move forward by amending the Act, then my door does remain open to them I'm, and I am happy to consider how the Act can be improved. If Parliament wishes to repeal the Act, then the government's primary focus needs to be ensuring that people remain protected from these crimes and that vulnerable minority communities do not feel that they have been sidelined and marginalised. 
ensuring protection to minority communities would be something that everyone in this chamber can agree with. It is therefore something that we would hope we can work to build a consensus around so that we arrive at a practical and at a workable way forward. Delaying commencement is one option which would allow us to ensure that we have the time to put necessary protections in place and in particular to look at how the protection offered by Section 6, a very important provision as we've heard in the debate this afternoon, how the protection offered by Section 6 can be maintained in relation to threatening communications. We are prepared, presiding officer, to explore all of the options available to find a secure way forward which will address the concerns that have been raised by religious organisations and equality groups and groups like Victim Sport Scotland, Scottish Women's Convention and others. Concerns about the negative message that repeal will send, a message that can only realistically be addressed by ensuring continuity of protection to such communities. I would say to those who are supporting repeal that they should reflect very carefully about the impact of their decision to repeal the Act. What is the message that is being sent to minority communities and victims of hatred and discrimination? There is surely a danger that the message being sent is that the rights of the abusive, bigoted minority are more important than the rights of the majority who are fed up with this hateful and prejudicial behaviour. Saying that we need to stand up to abusive behaviour at football is no good without action. And repealing the Act with no alternative to offer, no plan to ensure continuity or protection to vulnerable communities is worse than taking no action. It is dragging us back to where we started and will completely fail, presiding officer, to make the match day experience one that really is open to all. Thank you, presiding officer. I now call James Kelly to take us up to decision time, please, Mr Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, let me start by echoing the comments of Joanne Lamont and Fulton McGregor that uh, I'm sure every member of uh, the, the Parliament will agree that uh, hateful or sectarian behaviour, whether it takes place in the street in a local community, outside a religious venue or at a football ground, is completely unacceptable uh, and should be tackled. Uh, I think where, the, as the debate is well known, there have been some sharp disagreements. We obviously agree uh, in, in the terms of such behaviour is unacceptable. Where the disagreement is, is how that is tackled. I think... Uh, one of the, the strands that's come through in the debate um, is, I mean, there were some, there, was, there were different contributions from the SNP benches. I, I didn't agree with uh, Marie Goujon, but I thought she argued her case uh, very well. Um, however, uh, there was a strand coming through that uh, there's an issue about football fans. Football fans are a problem. You know, we need to, we need to deal with them. Uh, and I think that it's that attitude that brought the legislation forward in the first place. Um, in the context, not, not, just, not just yet, uh, Mr Dornan. Um, in the context, I mean, my experience as a football fan uh, since 1969, um, I, I've, watched the, the, I've watched things move through the years. I don't seek to gloss over any recent events or any public disorder, but... The, the issue of sectarianism and fan behaviour has improved uh, dramatically in that time. I was at the 1980 uh, Scottish Cup final uh, where fans uh, fought actively on the pitch and ran down the terraces. You know, I couldn't get back up the terrace and for people running down to get onto the pitch. We're not living in those times uh, where people actively threw bottles uh, in the grounds or fought out in the streets. Uh, things, things mo have moved on and it's that, that context that perhaps some of those in the SNP benches who clearly don't have any experience uh, of uh, football you know, should remember. We also heard a lot about the, the gap, uh, the, the supposed gap in the law. Um, but you know, as John Finney and others pointed out in the Law Society evidence, they were very explicit in terms of the, the different uh, law suites that were available 
uh, in relation to pre-existing law. And yeah, sure. Mary Gujion. I thank the member for taking an intervention on that point. But the one thing that has failed to be answered throughout the whole of this debate we've had today is particularly in terms of Section 6. What, how are we going to dissolve the grey area that, was, that the, the Section 6 was designed to dissolve in the Communications Act in 2003, the gaps in sentencing and the extraterritorial uh, jurisdiction and the powers there? How are we going to overcome and resolve all those issues if we repeal this Act? Mm -hmm. James Kelly. I, I would say I will reflect on, on all the points that have been raised in the debate. However, when you've got a section of an Act where there was only one conviction in 2015-16, it is clearly not working. It's all very well standing up and making a point, making a point about extraterritorial uh, application of that law. But if, as the police officers have told us, if the threshold's too high, it's just a law in paper, it's not a law in practice. So that's something that clearly uh, has to be addressed. Now, uh, Ben McPherson, made the point that I was, you know, I shouldn't rush ahead with this legislation. Perhaps I could just point out that in terms of progressing this, uh, I, I had my first meeting with the non-governmental bills unit in the first week of June 2016. So I've been working on this legislation for over 18 months and as outlined at the start, uh, there's quite a robust process to go through. So it's not a case of, of rushing through. Yeah, Mr Dorman. Kelly, can I ask James Mr. Dornan. Sorry, Mr. Signal. So can I ask Mr. Kelly then, if, he, if he's been working for this for the best part of two years, why he hasn't got an answer to the question that Marie Goujon asked him? James Kelly. If you'd actually, if you'd actually been listening, Mr. Dornan, I gave a, a direct answer to the point that Marie Goujon uh, raised. Uh, so, uh, you know, Ben McPherson should, shouldn't uh, rush ahead with the legislation, and others said, no, I've t I need to make some progress, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr McPherson. I do need to, sorry, I do need to make some progress. Um, and others have suggested that we should wait on the outcome of the Brackendale review uh, into hate crime. And I think that review does have an important place to play. However, as Lee MacArthur pointed out at the Justice Committee, the Justice uh, Committee are currently considering the civil litigation legislation, uh, which is a result of the Taylor report. <laughs> which was uh, produced in 2013. So I don't think uh, we can wait, uh, you know, four years to, to deal with this legislation, particularly when the law is so discredited, uh, so weak, uh, and needs to be taken off the statute book. The other point that the, the minister repeatedly made, and others, about uh, the need for amendments, and uh, I was quite amused by this, because, you know, all the way through the previous parliament, you know, the SNP weren't interested in any uh, amendment. They repeatedly told us we needed this legislation. But the minute they've got into trouble, they suddenly, uh, the doors open to amendment. And, you know, the point I would make is, of all the speeches that were made about p how people accepted that it did need an amendment, nobody from the SNP was pre prepared to articulate the problems with the Act and, and, and prepared to put forward any concrete ideas in terms, uh, in terms of evidence. Annabel Ewing. To the member for taking the intervention. Well, well, could I gently suggest to the member then that surely there would be reason to consider how we working together collectively with consensus can improve the Act to give the protections that people need rather than simply taking away all these protections with uh, Mr Kelly's bill. James Kelly. I've made, it, I've made it absolutely clear that I think this Act is discredited. It's discredited um, because for the central points that people have made in the debate, it doesn't work as an act of law. Uh, there are confusions around interpretation, and as the Law Society pointed out, that could result in further legal challenge. So it doesn't actually work uh, as an act of law. and needs to be taken off the statute book. Now, there were some... Um, the, 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 one of the points that was made uh, to me was that what was the alternative? And I have outlined... Uh, an alternative previously and I did in my opening speech but for those uh, who weren't listening uh, I'll go through that again picking out some of the strands and what we heard so first of all uh, a law that sends out a weak message I mean look at this debate this afternoon you know there's apart from the SNP 
no opposition politician has supported the Act. What sort of message does that send out? It's clearly not an Act that's got any credibility. It's not working. So if you take, first of all, if you take that off, it's more effective. And we need one law. If, if people commit hateful action in the street, uh, outside a religious venue or a football ground, it should be tackled. But we need one law to do it. We don't need, uh, we don't need two laws. I think we also, as John Finney pointed out, should look at alternatives to pro prosecution. And Sacro made this point uh, at the committee. We need uh, investment in education uh, to tackle sectarian, when it, uh, sectarianism. We need a different approach, because clearly the current approach is not working. Only 7% of the religious aggravations uh, were, were focused around football grounds. And we need to bring uh, fans, police, and football clubs together, as the Scottish uh, Football Supporters Association uh, have suggested. Uh, and moving to my summing up, Mr Dornan described me as a compliant politician. And I have to say that I found that, that remark uh, deeply insulting. I have consistently uh, opposed this act. And if there, is, if there is bad law in a parliament, then it's a responsible job of a member of that parliament to call that bad law out. <laughs> what I am being compliant in is calling out an, un an ineffective and unfair law. What we need now, that there's an onus here on the government to try and bring people together. The, 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 case, the, the case in terms of the existing act is completely discredited. And we need, we need a more minister, we need a more unified approach that brings together the politicians, that brings together the fans, that brings together the groups outside Parliament and produces a, 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 an approach that tackles sectarianism and doesn't hide behind a law that isn't work. And with that uh, final point, uh, presiding officer, I submit my view in support of the general principles of the repeal bill. Thank you very much, and that concludes our debate on the Offensive Behaviour at Football Bill at Stage 1. We move now to the next item of business. Before we do, I just want to say a few words uh, following uh, the, uh, this afternoon's First Minister's questions. And I have to say, I was very disappointed by the behaviour uh, displayed this afternoon at First Minister's questions. And in particular, I wanted to make it clear that it is never acceptable to use words such as lies, liar or lying uh, in this chamber, particularly when describing another member. What I would also say is that I expect the best from every member in this chamber, and I'm rarely let down. I understand that passions do sometimes run high and that in the heat of the moment, intemperate language can be used. Now, I will not hesitate to do so when necessary, but I do not see my role as primarily being one of rebuking or chastising members, rather of standing behind you and allowing you to be the best you can be. So in these occasions, I try to allow members the opportunity to reflect on their behaviour rather than escalate matters. And it was noticeable that the First Minister did exactly that and used the opportunity of her final answer to reflect on the importance and power of words. I would perhaps urge Mr uh, Rennie to show the same maturity. Thank you very much. We'll move now to the next item of business, which is decision time. And there's one question today, as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 10072 in the name of James Kelly on the offensive behaviour at football and threatening communications repeal Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10072 in the name of James Kelly is yes, 65, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed.
And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.